Yeah, this is Tyke. Um, he's a four-year-old Malinois. Um, came from the Netherlands and uh, was my partner on the street for about three years. You know, I have two kids. Uh, my son's four, my daughter's two. And, dude, I can leave him just like this. Kids crawled all over him and completely fine. Is he, is he still a good watchdog after being, like, out of, oh, the, yeah. out of the game a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I don't or? think that's ever going to leave him. And he's just, oh, boom. Yeah. Is, is there ever been, a, ever been an occasion where, like, he hits hard and you're like, there's a cop over there, should I even begin this conversation? It hasn't, this you know, guy? honestly, no. I'm, I'm just like, <laughs> you'll find it when you find it, brother. Yeah. I don't even, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it's funny. and he's been off the street for so long, I don't even know if he's, yeah, I, mean, I gotcha. hope that he's not going to, you know, he's, he's actually alerting to dope, but who knows, could be a cheeseburger in there. <laughs> I need to give him his credit. A, a double, I need to give him his credit. A, ra a double double rapper. <laughs> yeah, I submitted out or something. So, dude, I want. That. Yeah, he was a lot of fun, man. We, we, you know, definitely cut short, but I had a lot of fun with him. We did a lot, dude. It only took him about two weeks on the street to get right to work. Mm. You know, um, we did a. He's from the Netherlands. Yeah. Oh. He got. He was an import. In, straight import. So we had to put a bunch of work into him. Um, but he did, he did really good. We went to uh, skid school, which is basically a SWAT school for dogs. Full, so te yes. full team of dudes. He had no idea. Oh, oh. He's got nails, dude. I'm sorry. It's all good. Oh, buddy. Oh. <laughs> oh. I got to cut. I forgot to cut his nails. I washed him, but uh, look sorry. at all the hair coming sorry, dude. There goes the gym, dude. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Ours is um, the same. It's all yeah, good, dude. buddies. There you go, boys. No, but he did great. Like, so around a bunch of SWAT guys that look like they're in bite suits. We had never worked with him before. I only had about two weeks on the street from being skids trained. And uh, it was an interrupted um, home res uh, residential burglary. Bad guys come out of the house as the cops are getting there in SF. And one of the bad guys take, takes a shot at one of the cops and takes off running. So they call for a SWAT dog. And I'm like, cool, I'm right here. But I'm like, man, I should probably tell them that I've never even been on a SWAT deployment yet. <laughs> like I'm like very fresh in this. and. Uh, their, their team leader's like, hey, are you the uh, SWAT dog? I'm like, yeah. He's like, cool, let's go. Just like, as soon as I got there, I'm like, oh my God, dude. <laughs> Full-time team, just studs, you yeah. know? And the dude's holding his rifle with his left hand, one-handed, reaches down and just picks Tyke up with his handle on top of his harness and lets him go to work. Like, it was the coolest thing I'd seen <laughs> on the street, honestly, other than him biting. And he was uh, totally with it. With eyes on target. Yeah, yeah dude, I'm like, holy crap, it was awesome. And I was super nervous because they all look like bite suits. And I'm like, oh my God, dude. If yeah, he bites one of them, we are screwed, dude. We're yeah, never doing this. Because they're all fully kitted when they yeah. show yeah. yeah. And you know, they're moving quickly. Motions are a little bit different. And emotions run right down this leash. And I'm a little nervous. I'm, I got adrenaline rolling. And I'm like, all right, Tyke, this is the major leagues, bro. Like, yeah. We cannot <laughs> fail right now. You're up I don't to wanna, bait. You're yeah, up to bat. Yeah. I don't want to do another game in AAA, dude. Come on, you know, I'm going to get sent back down. <laughs> welcome back to the Iron Sights Podcast. After dark, I'm here with uh, Nick McCarthy. Nick, welcome to the show, dude. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm excited to get into today. I've sort of been trying to sort of uh, psychologically and emotionally prep for this because there's a lot of things in this episode that I want to make sure we spend our time on. Um, and really kind of dig into the details with, because you come with a uh, background in law enforcement, recently retired about eight days ago. Eight days. And you're a young dude. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, you know, and, and I don't think most people get into law enforcement thinking they're probably going to retire at the age that you're, you're already retired at. And so we want to talk through those things. There's some history there. I think there's some really important um I'm just going to say topics that need to be touched on along the way, some of which have been talked about on this show before, some of which haven't, and some that you're going to, I think, kind of enlighten me and the listeners to. So I hope people can really settle in and kind of get their mind right around this. But one of the interesting facts about you is you're a canine officer. I am. And yeah. uh, we got Tyke here in the studio today. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you're going to see some stuff on Tyke later and get him on the get him on some of the social media. He's a good looking dude. How old is that guy? He's four. Yeah, it's four years old. Wow. So um, it's a beautiful Malinois, and we'll see that. And everybody knows my, um, my, my, uh, basically it's an affliction. Like I have an addiction to Malinois now. And that happens, man. Yeah. As soon as you find one or you yeah. get one or you just pet one, it's on. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's a special connection there as well. But hey, man, I, I mean, there's a lot to uncover here, but, uh, you know, let's just talk about who you are, where you kind of came from, and how we, Ultimately, we'll get to kind of how we wound up here today and some of the deeper topics, if you don't mind. Yeah, man. Um, so I was born and raised in uh, Sonoma County, uh, about 45 minutes, 50 minutes north of San Francisco. Uh, born into a huge law enforcement family. Um, 
you know, I can honestly say everyone's a cop in my family. Um, we got one that isn't, but, uh, I think wow. every, every family does. Um, and, uh, you know, I wasn't that kid that was like, I want to be a cop. I was just going to you know? say that, like, that's gotta be tough. Like generationally, I, that's gotta be a little bit of pressure. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, I mean, it was always something I was interested in, you know, and I kind of faced it with, you know, I got that in my back pocket if I ever needed it, you know, it interests me, but you know, dinner table was like a graveyard briefing. You know, my stepmom was a cop. My dad was a cop. My stepdad was a cop, uncles, cousins. I mean, it was just, that's all it was. Wow. Um, so from a young age, I was like, you know, I like law enforcement, but I kind of want to do my own thing. You know, I don't necessarily want to get into it immediately. Um, but obviously I ended up getting into it. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, when I was 14 and a half, I really found my first love. I was independence. <laughs> uh, my dad was like, look, dude, you're driving me nuts and you have your head up your ass. Uh, and if you want something, you're going to, you're going to work for it. So hold on. Was this just dad with the tough love or were you really being a real piece of shit? Oh uh, no, I was, I had my head up my ass for okay. sure. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and you know, my dad, he's an old school guy, you know, it's like, if you don't have a good work ethic, that's a problem. And he quickly corrected that. And thank God. Cause I look back on it now, you know, during those times it was head button a little bit. Oh, but, I got a dad. I was <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but luckily he, you know, taught me that. So I went and got my first job 14 and a half. Um, I got a work permit through the city. And as long as I kept a certain grade point average, I could work a couple hours during the week. Cool. Um, so I was bagging groceries. Uh, oh, first, I love this. <laughs> yeah. Dude, How many the same interactions way. do you get with different uh, people throughout the it, day it, it was, bagging groceries? It was yeah. nuts. It yeah. was nuts. You know, honestly, that prepared me more for law enforcement than anything else. Like I, it was, <laughs> I, I guess I sort of believe you yeah. on that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, um, wasn't all that into school. Um, you know, so I liked working more cause there was something that I could tangibly get from it. I think, you know, obviously school's great for people who love school. Um, but it just wasn't for me. Do you mean like high school, college, all of it? All of it. Gotcha. Yeah. All of it. I barely made it through high school. I mean, the ink was running out when they printed my diploma, you know, <laughs> like, um, so <laughs> I was lucky enough to actually get one and move on, but, um, not a lick of college, you know, I, I went straight to the workforce. Um, so in high school, I met my wife, um, uh, been together 15 years, married for eight. Um, she was a junior. I was a, a, a senior. Um, and we both kind of were the same, you know what I mean? We had full-time jobs straight out of high school. Okay. Um, and we ended up renting our, our first house when we were 19. Okay. Um, started early, started early, you know, and with what comes with that is all that responsibility. You got payments, you got, you know, rent and everything else. Um, so I, you know, quickly realized, Hey, this money isn't as good as I thought it was. Mm -hmm. Cause now I have none after all my bills are paid. This is a great life lesson. Man. <laughs> yeah. It's a great yeah. character builder too, by the way. Yeah. And so, um, I kind of had one of those, you know, look myself in the mirror, have a conversation. Like, what do you want to do? Cause I was working at a lumber yard, um, for probably about five years and dude, I didn't have a gym membership, but I was in killer shape, like putting just pounds on my shoulder, destroying my body. Um, luckily I was younger back then. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I kind of made a list for myself. Like what, what interests me? What am I, what do I want to do? Cause I wanted, you know, the house, I wanted to get married. I wanted to have kids and just be financially set. Um, so it wasn't immediately law enforcement for me. I started going down that list and I'm like, you know, dogs, dogs interest me. And I'm, you know, one of those guys that it wasn't the dog training that interests me, uh, you know, initially it was just that companionship, that dog owner, dog, you I know, that totally relationship. Relate. Yeah. I totally relate. And my whole life, all I had was shepherds. I had, you know, my first German shepherd when I was like five. And then throughout the course of my, my, you know, it's young like childhood. Law, it's a law enforcement thing, right? I mean, they're yeah, around. Totally. Yeah, totally. And, and especially with everybody in my life, basically that was cops. I grew up in a police department. You know, I, I, I was around dogs all the time, cop dogs, whatever. I mean, personal protection dogs, just mm -hmm. they, everybody, everybody that had a dog, I was gravitating towards them. Um, at that time I had two shepherds of my own, which I still have. Um, so I'm like, you know, what can I do that incorporates dogs? Mm -hmm. And so I kind of go, I went down that path of dog trainer and, and I'm like for, you know, just for my own reasons, it just didn't captivate me as much as bang canine handler. You know, I was like, you're with the dogs all day working dude, versus work the dogs all day and necessarily training them and somebody not, not working with somebody else's dog, you're right, working with your own dog. Right. And I and, think I can totally get it. And it was like, you know, I can, I have the training aspect of, 
you know, dog training when it's a canine handler, but it was that work, you know, Mm -hmm. that, that I can actually train my dog and then go put it to use Mm -hmm. as a canine handler in law enforcement. Um, so I immediately, I was like, boom, that was it. Um, you know, it wasn't about being a cop. I didn't want to be a cop. I wanted to be a canine handler. Wow. So that's interesting. So time out for a second, because first there's a couple of things. One is what you just said. Like, did you, I was just going to ask you, did you want to work with canines more than you wanted to be a cop? Was it equal or less? And you just made that very clear Two, becoming a canine officer is not an easy thing to do. There's a huge selection process that goes, right. Like I'm no expert at this, but going in with the expectation that you're going to be a canine handler is setting yourself up for some, probably some, a huge amount of disappointment and ultimate failure in a lot of cases. Right. So how does this work out? Well, I mean, it, it worked out great in the end, but it was a long grinding road. You know, I got hired with an agency where very quickly I realized, Hey, it's going to be five, six years before a spot even opens. So So are you going to have to pay your dues and totally take your licks and all that? And it was like, so what can I do to make myself, you know, that much better in, you know, I knew there was going to be an oral board. I knew there was a selection process and I've always been that type of person where I've always had to work twice as hard as the next person for the same thing. Mm. Those are just, that's just the cards that were dealt to me. And this goes back to the school thing. I mean, some people find that very easy process and the institution they can settle into and others are just like, uh, this isn't, that's the, this isn't for me. Yeah. Yeah, Got it. And so I was like, you know, obviously it's going to be a, a ton of work, but there was also that aspect where it's like, I got to learn to be a cop first. I can't just go into this being like, I'm going to be a canine handler. That's it. Wake up call. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) for sure. And I, you know, I got hired with a, with a old school, hard nosed, big work ethic agency that was, you know, very, very serious about, we produce good, well-rounded street cops. Be a blessing and a curse, right? Totally. And it's like, it was a culture shock to me. You know, I grew up in an agricultural community. All my buddies were working in dairies and hauling hay. And, you know, I get hired with an agency where it's straight inner city and Mm. just completely different than anything I'd ever experienced before. Um, so I'm like, how am I going to be effective down here? Um, you know, and ultimately get that goal of a canine handler. So I remember I was in, God, it was must first month FTO. Um, and I see this unmarked car come driving up into the back lot and he's got a dog in the back. I'm like, man, you know, I'd never even seen it on my car with a dog in it before. I can't say as I have either. I mean, I guess it's probably the point, but right. <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> but I haven't. <laughs> um, and you know, the dude gets out, he's plain clothes, beard. Um, and my FTO is like, yeah, he's working on a task force with a federal agency. Um, you know, and he's had his dog for, I don't know, I think it was about five years, um, at that point. Um, so I was obviously super motivated to go talk to him, but I was a new, no one knew who I was. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It was like, oh man, should I, or should I Yeah, there's I a pecking order, right? Yeah, like, yeah. is this okay to go, right? It's like going into the, on the jujitsu mat. You don't, your white belt don't ask a fucking black belt to <laughs> right, spar. Right. You just don't do that. It's and just, so my, some and etiquette, it, right? And it was funny too. My FTO was like, uh, dude, you're down like a hundred reports. You don't have time to go talk about dog stuff. Right. Dude. Yeah. Like, are you done? Yeah. yeah you're like, not done. Why are you go. here? Why are you still yeah. standing here? And he yeah. used to be like, chop, chop, dude. Chop, chop. That's all he said to me. I'm like, dude, God, you know what? I don't even care. I'm going to go talk to him. Um, so I did, I went and talked to him and he's actually a real good buddy of mine now. Oh, Um, outstanding. Yeah. It's awesome. And, uh, I'm like, Hey dude, what can I do to make myself better when it comes to that selection process? Mm -hmm. You know? And he's like, well, first dude, you need to learn how to be a street cop. Like get out of here with the, with the, you're going to be a canine handler. I love the, you know, that that's something that interests you. Um, but dude, you gotta learn to be a cop first. He's like, but I'll tell you this, you know, we want handlers that are proactive. We want handlers that make good decisions. We basically, the way that he put it was, I want a detective, a street cop and a sergeant molded into one as a canine. Wow, that's, that's a tall order to film. Yeah. Man. Yeah. So, you know, I took that and I kind of, that, that doesn't come with a couple of years. No, dude. Yeah. No, this is, this is like, all right. You know, I knew I had a road in front of me and he also was like, Hey, I want someone who's going to put their own time in. I want people mm. who show up to canine trainings you know, not necessarily getting in a buy suit all the time, but I want someone who's watching to learn, you know, yep. ask questions, get out there, show your face and put your own time in. Um, at, now on the, at that time, it was five, six years before an opportunity would ever be presented to, you know, to me to be able to test for it. So I'm like, all right, I set up a plan, you know, I'm like, I got to make it through FTO, obviously. Right. Um, step one, step yep. one. And, but once I do, I'm going to hit the ground running, you know what I mean? I want to make it so hard for all the other applicants that, 
whoever's putting on the test can't tell me no. So it's funny you bring that up. I love that, that approach because I was taught to me at a very young, a uh, very early age by a firefighter at a, um, sort of a mentor. And, uh, we used to do some, some backpacking and outback stuff. And this guy was, you know, sort of put together this group and he was a firefighter, but late in his life, uh, he was in his late thirties, which is very old to become a firefighter right. yeah. um, and start a career. But prior to that, he had done a lot of things, construction. There was some hazardous material stuff that he had done in other career paths before he finally went down this, this path. But what he told me when he went in to see the captain, he goes, when I walk in to see the captain and, or the chief to do my final, final interview, excuse me, the chief goes, I want to be able to, to answer that question. That inevitable question is, is well, I have 10 other people here that have similar qualifications, more experience than you do as a firefighter or whatever else. Give me, tell me why I shouldn't hire you. And right. you, the answer you want to be able to give is, to, or why should I hire you over them? The answer you want to be able to give is you tell me why I shouldn't be hired. Right. right. right? And, and you want that kind of confidence totally. going into the interview. I remember taking that with me as a kid going every single interview I go into from here on out, um, that or, or, or situation, whether it's a negotiation or anything else, I want to have that kind of confidence walking in. So it's making sure you're prepared, making sure you're dressed the part, you look the part, you can talk the part, you've done your research, you've all the things that I think you're, you're talking about doing right now is like for the next five years or six years, cause it's right. what it's going to take, I'm going to grind my ass off to be basically a canine handler without having been handed right. the title and or the leash yet for yeah. lack of a better word. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, I, I was like, you know, I'm going to do this, but I really don't know how yet. You know what I mean? Cause I, I was in, I was so early in my career that I had no idea really how to, what a street cop really ultimately did. Like I knew the basic, you know, foundational police work stuff, but you know, something that got taught to me real early in my career, which, you know, I've actually made as a foundation for the rest of my life was there is a difference between police officers and cops. There's a big difference. It's only, it's only one. Um, and that's not to say that, you know, cops are better than police officers or anything like that. It's nothing, but cops show up every single day with a fire under their ass to hunt the boogeyman. Mm. And they're hunters, they're hunters. They don't, you know, and they, they come to work with that. Like they, there is no outline. There's no nothing. It's like, dude, I'm going to take people to jail. That's it. Um, obviously who deserve to go to jail, but yeah, <laughs> let's come back to that. Yeah. yeah. And you know, so I was like, okay, I gotta, I, I'm, I gotta get through this FTO program. Once I do, I'm going to hit the ground running. Like I'm, I'm just going to full hundred miles an hour and I'm, I'm going to do this. Um, and you know, keep in mind, and I, I didn't mention this, but I had family who was in this agency that I got hired with in the Bay area. Okay. Um, and again, blessing and a curse, blessing and a curse, mm -hmm. huge, huge shoes to fill. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my uncle was a, a retired sergeant there. Legend legend. <laughs> um, and, and my cousin, his son, uh, was still working there. I think he had, he's probably 10 years on at that point and had already created a reputation for himself of being a legend. Like he was finding bad guys every night. He, you know, again, again that can work both. That can work two ways for the next generation right. coming through. Man. And yeah. when I got hired, he had already been accepted to a, um, a countywide task force for vehicle theft. So he was on his way, you yeah. know, super um, cop. <laughs> totally. And there was a lot of pressure that I actually put on myself where it's like, dude, I don't want to be known as just another McCarthy here. I want to be known as Nick McCarthy for with my own work ethic, my own niche in this game. Cause a lot of people don't understand there's tons of different, you know, things in law enforcement that you can be good at. And maybe you're not good at other things. I think this is very relatable in a lot of things, man. Like not just law enforcement outside of there for people that have siblings or family members or whatever that have right. a history and a reputation good or bad. Right. Reputation. Yeah. I mean, I, just to add a little, a little color to this, I remember, so I was a pretty good student, right. And I kept my nose um, out of trouble, generally speaking at school, because I knew how it would impact me in the sports that I played. And if I wasn't getting it done in the classroom, then I wasn't going to be able to, or allowed to do it on the field. Right. So I kept my shit together um, for the most part. Um, my little brother came through, you know, like later on. And there were a couple of things like one was like they, they the, the teacher would come into class and go, Oh, wait, how are you, are you Scott's little brother? And he'd be like, yeah, and, you know, he'd be like, right. yeah, you know, like <laughs> wasn't super happy about that. And they were automatically thinking like he was going to be, oh, this is going to be great. Right. Like I was a fucking TA. I did all that. 
brothers, like the office. <laughs> my mom was getting phone calls home from school later on. But then another, th in other ways, like my brother brought talents to the table that I, you know, that, that wasn't me. Like they were shocked that we were even related. Like right. how is, how are you even yeah, related to that's that similar. guy? Yeah. That's how similar. are you even related to that guy? Yeah, yeah. You know, and I do, my cousin can find a, a, a stolen car. Like it was nothing. You could smell it from a mile Dude, he'd be on his way home, yeah. like out of uniform, just on his way home. And he's like, uh, that thing's stolen. Yeah. So, so uh, sorry, sorry to get off track there a little bit, but you're, you're filling shoes, you're putting pressure on yourself is what you were saying was going on. Right. So, you know, but I, but I ultimately saw that canine was my niche. No one in my family had had a dog. So I was, I was pumped on that. And I'm like, okay, so that gave me that motivation to be like, dude, this is going to be a lot of years of a lot of hard work, mm -hmm. but when you get there, it's going to feel that much better yep. because you're you going to, you did it's me. you, you yeah, did you. Yeah. 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 So, you know, once FTO stopped and I made it through that, um, and you know, my agency and God bless them. Uh, and I, and I, I love this about them. They didn't, <laughs> there was no handouts. You know what I mean? Like, Hey, your cousin is here and your uncle's a legend, but we don't give a fuck. Uh, you know what I mean? Like it was straight that needs up to like happen that. more. Right. That needs to happen no, it more, does. Yeah. It does. And I, and I loved that about that place. Um, and, and you know, that, there are so many more other incidents about that that we can get into. Yeah, better. nepotism is a killer, man. Right. So yeah, and they made it very, very clear. clear. Oh, yeah. dude, like right off the tip, it was it was like here's your FTOs, and I'm looking at the FTOs, and I obviously before you get into FTOs, yeah, you, you know, know everybody, it's like going into school, right? Like, right. oh, don't please don't give me that, math dude. Teacher. What do I have? Please don't give me Mrs. Mrs. <laughs> right, <Mary>. exactly. <laughs> it's the same, dude. It was the same thing, and I'm looking at them, and I'm like, oh <laughs> fuck, dude, and <laughs> and and I'm like, well, you know that happened on purpose, <laughs> right? Exactly, which is. Dude, honestly, it made me that much better. That's great. Um, so I, I get out of I get out of FTO, and I, dude, I just started going to work. Like I, I had to. There was a, a period of time where I was still trying to figure things out. Because mm. um, once you clear FTO, it's a culture shock in itself. You're on your own. You're on your own, dude. Mm. And and you know you don't have someone next to you that you can bounce an idea off of real quick when you're heading to a hot call or or any call at that matter. You know what I mean? Um, so I, you know. I put my work ethic to, to use, man. I was like, I know that there's bad guys here and I didn't work in the craziest of busy areas. You know what I mean? But I also didn't work in Mayberry. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I was, we were, uh, you know, we had some violent areas in our city, you know, um, some, some areas where the crime was real high. Yeah. I think there's a, you know, a lot of cities in, in the Bay area, but in the nation in general, that people don't want to recognize that. Like right. I, I live right here in, in San Jose. Right. And there are things that happen only a few miles from here that the people that live like my neighbors, Number one, have no idea even exists. Number two, so you can call that being naive or you can call that being ignorant. Right. They don't want to know. Right. They really don't. And they wouldn't believe it even if you told them. So those three things I find I kind of run into on a regular basis when I'm having conversations, standing out in the park with my dog on the leash or whatever right. else. I'm like, hey, how's it going? You know, like, oh, because I tend to be like, I know what's going on in yeah. the neighborhood. We're down here all the time. There's stuff happening and pe people are like, hey, did you hear about the thing? Did I hear about the thing? Did you hear about how that actually right. happened. Right. Yeah. Anyways. So, and, and, and you know, it's I, not good. It's not. And, and from where I was raised to now where I was working, dude, I was in a different planet. You know what I mean? And I was real nervous about that in the beginning where it's like, dude, this is a totally different area. Mm -hmm. I, I've never, I didn't even go South of the Golden Gate Bridge other than a Giants game, dude, when I was younger, you know what I mean? I just didn't have a reason to. Wow. Um, and once I got down there, I'm like, dude, yeah, that's where a, am I? You're right. It's a different planet. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, but it actually was a good thing for me because yeah. I'm like, dude, this is so different from where I live, where I was raised yeah. that I can kind of keep these two things separate. There's opportunity. You know? yeah. yeah. And, and so, um, I wasn't all that great at finding stolen cars. I was good at just finding bad guys, mm. whatever it was. Um, I wanted it. Um, so, you know, I really got into dope. I really got into guns. Um, that was a big motivational thing for me. I, I you know, I was like, I'm not going to sit around and wait for a call. Right. I want to go out and find these guys before they victimize the people I just swore an oath to protect. Mm -hmm. You know, I say, and that was that kind of work ethic coming back full circle from when I was 14. It's interesting you know? how that can be misconstrued and convoluted, you know, on the other end for people looking from on the outside, you know, looking in, yeah. they want more of a passive, just kind of be around and be ready when I call you. Right. Uh, the whole idea is so that you never have to call me. Exactly. Uh, that's the way I always looked at it. Right. And I think that was the, the parallel you were drawing between being a cop or being a police officer is what you want is the cop in your neighborhood all the time. That's not a bad thing, right? right? What you don't want is the person that's just shagging calls or driving through the neighborhood, right. never stopping, just going through routine route, going through the motions, uh, going through checking boxes yeah. or whatever else. Yeah. 
yeah, I mean, that, I mean, that's the quote unquote officer I want in my neighborhood all the time. Yeah. We'll find that shit before it turns into something. Like, yep. Dude, there it is. You yeah. know, and, and now a lot of things come with that cop work mm -hmm. ethic and you being a cop as opposed to a police officer, you're putting yourself in way more, uh, you know, potential bad shit happening. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of quickly found out out. You know what I mean? I, I comes with the territory. Yeah, man. And, and you better be comfortable with yourself. You know, you, you better know, honestly, you know, your policies and laws and all that, of course, but it's more so of being comfortable with your abilities. You know, it's like, you're either going to, police work is easy to understand if you don't convolute it with the rest of the world. It's either you're going to, people are going to go with the program or they're not. Mm. It's, it's that simple. And, and you may have to fight someone. You may have to chase someone. There may be shootings. There may be whatever it is, but you have to be ready for it. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I think if you stay with that work ethic of constantly trying to find bad guys before they do what you think they're going to do or ultimately what they're going to do, um, you're, you're that much more prepared for the bad stuff to happen because mm -hmm. you're already kind of working in that realm of high speed. And, and you know, I don't want to sit here and do nothing. You know? Can we talk about like that hunter mentality though, in doing being proactive the way you're saying or what you're talking about and getting into those situations because inevitably you're going to get into those situations, whether you're being proactive or not. Right. right? Yeah. But if you are that proactive person, you're just percentage of, of, of let's just say those situations goes up at their common situations, but your percentage of the, the, um, actual activity that you're having within those situations is higher than, you know, police officer, Joe Smith over here. Totally. Right. Um, and then that ends up showing up on a sergeant's desk, a captain's desk, a lieutenant's desk, right. A division commander's yeah. de yeah. desk. And then all of a sudden you can kind of be labeled if you're not careful with this guy's a problem. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Because my, some of my, my closest friends and I have a couple of them are the same dude, man. Right. And they got really disenfranchised with trying to be a good cop uh, because not that they were doing anything wrong, but because they were, they were told, we want you to stop being the cop that you are or right. tone it down. Tone it down. If you will. Can yeah. you, can you talk, talk yeah, about that? Sure. I, I mean, in, that's the case in, in a lot of agencies, you know, like they're they're especially in this day and age mm -hmm. there there's cops put getting put on the bench that all they want to do is go find bad guys for their community. And it's like, no, nah, we don't want that. You know, we don't want that attention. Um, cause ultimately bad shit happens when you're really looking for it. You know, it's that boogeyman. He, he he's in all shapes and sizes, man. And if you're looking for him, you're going to find, find him. him. Yeah, yeah. You're going to find him. And so my agency was awesome with this. And I, and I honestly, I can say this, there was never a time where they told me slow down. There was wow. Never. In fact, there was more of a hey, dude, keep doing what you're doing. Oh, and if you that. can, and if you can go higher and keep pushing, do it. You know what right. I mean? Cause but there's also that really fine line in the very beginning of the stages of you building yourself like that to knowing when's the right. And when's right. the wisdom piece that you Dude, lack. Yeah. Totally. And it's, yeah. and it's, you know, that you have to show your supervisors that you are trustworthy. If you can't make the right decision under stressful circumstances, you need to shut it down. And that's when I think a lot of these, these times you'll have people saying, Hey bro, like let's, let's have a talk. Like, because I, and I've seen this before, there'll be guys who are, who are hunting who are just on the radio all the time, but it's noise. Mm. It's not, it's not sub, there's nothing coming from it. You know what gotcha. I mean? Mm -hmm. And, and that's not to say that that's wrong or bad because eventually, hopefully they will get there to where they have results from their work they're doing. But some go into these situations because they think they're a cop. They mm. think they have that, they have that they're enough experience. They're ahead of themselves. They got to slow down, pull it back a little bit and learn and then build themselves to get to that point. Some people skip this whole learning phase. And they go straight to this. Yeah. They want to go straight to like, I want to learn all the secrets and the fancy yeah, shit. And that's yeah. when you get into kind of that cowboy shit that mm. most of the time you're lucky that shit didn't go South. You know, it's not, you, you got to have a formulated plan with what you're doing. Cause if you're, if you don't, shit's going to go left. And, and when it does, you're not even prepared for it because you're not there yet. Um, and so my agency is super cool, dude. They're like, look, you're, you know, you're doing what you're supposed to do, you know? And, and they were real big and not giving people big heads. You know what I mean? They weren't like, Hey bro, you're the best thing ever. So and it's a dichotomy of the, you know, uh, the dichotomy of, Hey, you're not getting a, you're not getting a free pass. Cause you're right. You, you, your uncle, exactly. you know, or whatever. And, and it was also though, like that, that same thing where, Hey, we know your family, all that stuff. And my, my family was the same type of way. They were just, dude, taking people to jail all the time, bad guys to jail. But you know, like the, the, the basic foundation of my department was this. 
That's what made it, I think, easier. Like, dude, my, my agency was full of cops just like me. Like, we were all that way because that's the breed that they wanted to push through. And they've been known shit throughout the state mm. for, for producing real good uh, street cops. Can you talk about like that, again, going sort of back to the dichotomy of when somebody needs to get be talked to, right? And kind of what you maybe experienced through uh, the leadership that you were under at a time maybe when you needed to have it. You didn't know, maybe you right. didn't realize it, but you needed to have a talk or they were, they were getting in front of something that they saw coming that you couldn't have ever seen coming and how they did it. Yeah, totally. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think I had about two years on, I was getting in a lot of pursuits. I mean, I was, dude, it was a couple of a week, sometimes two a night. Like it was just, I, I was finding cars, they were taking off and that was as simple as that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then your, your younger years as a cop, you're, you're chasing cars, hundred miles an hour is the best thing ever. Right. Well, you, you kind of lose sight of, is this worth it? Mm. Right? Like, Hey, you're putting actually the public in jeopardy because you're pushing this and then the crime ain't even there. For he's a got, stolen car. Dude, yeah. He's got, a, or he's got a broken <laughs> taillight and you're now you're chasing them all through the city. My agency made it clear and they did it in a real, in actually a really good way. And, and keep in mind, like all my sergeants, all our command staff were cops. They were, they were street cops. They were guys that did what I was doing. So they understood where I was at mm -hmm. You know, in this one incident, you know, they sat me down. They're like, dude, you're doing a great job. Um, you know, you're taking a lot of bad people to jail and we appreciate that. But think about this. Like you're chasing, you just chased a car last night. I think it, it dude, I don't even, I, I think it had expired reg or something and takes off and I'm chasing it. Sergeant shuts it down. Hey dude, cancel. And they were like, hey, as you build yourself and you become this leader that we ultimately want you to be, um, how about cancel yourself? Yeah. How, he's like, and, and he did it. He goes, what do you think I would think if you canceled yourself? I'm like, ah, I really don't. I mean, if it needs to be canceled, I'll cancel it. He goes, no, that's your decision-making under stressful circumstances, dude. Mm. You're canceling yourself because you're thinking, Hey, this ain't worth it. You're being able to, you're actually pulling yourself Some back outside looking in. Yeah. You're pulling yourself back, even <laughs> though you're kind of tunneled. And this is the greatest shit ever. Cause you're chasing a car. This is what you, that's what you signed up for. Right? Yeah. yeah. But you're being able to kind of, step back, even though you're in this great spot that you love, right. But you're being able to see the bigger picture. Hey man, I'm going to cancel myself, man. This is such a, like just looking at life, right. Yeah. If you get into like this hot zone of whatever it is that you happen to be in, in life outside of law enforcement, right. right? It's the argument that you're having with your spouse or the, 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 I don't know, in the world of business, you got the customer or the employee standing for it. It's just infuriating you because they just can't get to the other side. Then all of a sudden you figure, you find yourself not being able to get to the other side and you got the tunnel vision and it's just like, you're locked on and you say stuff that you know you shouldn't have said, but you're saying it anyway, right. you're reacting on emotion and all these other things like that ability to step outside. Um, generally comes with having have been in those circumstances a lot of time and really having to eat shit with a spoon and a smile at right. the end of the day. Absolutely. Right. Like, yeah. like, man, I was wrong. Whether you admit it or not, you know, you are, and then you have to take that to the next situation. So canceling yourself. And I guess in the, um, I guess in the, just sort of like how this all happens, this is a leader that's coming to you and not reprimanding you for doing what you did, but bringing attention to how you could have done it better and what exactly. to do better next time. So it's like, Hey man, great job, but not really. And let me tell you why, right? Right. Not, this is going in your file. Nope. Um, you know, take a seat for a couple of days. Think about what you did. Let me put my arm around you, like arm on the shoulder. I'm telling you, but at the same time, as he's sending you on your way, like now, you know, don't ever fucking do that again. You know, it, it, it <clears throat> was that, it was that a hey, dude, you need to, cause once you, once you're averaging per, a pursuit a night, three a week. Sounds like a lot to me, but I have right. no idea. It's a, it's a, it is, <laughs> it, it's a lot, you know? And, and now that I had that sit down, it was like, dude, now, you know, now the, the line's been drawn, not necessarily a line's been drawn, but now you have this knowledge. Now we'll see what you do with see it. See what you do with it. It was a test, dude. It was yeah. a test because what happened the next night I was in a pursuit. Yeah. So how you internalize this is important too on your right. end, right? Like yeah. this guy's looking out for me or this guy's picking on me. You can look at it in one of two ways, yep. right? There's an opportunity for me here. Yeah, yeah and, I love that. And you it's a great example. And you could have easily, as a young cop who thinks he's better than he is, you could have, I could have very easily been like, fuck that dude. I'm going right. to chase this shit. I don't, right. you know, you cancel me. That's your job. But I didn't, mm. I was like, all right, you know, obviously he's telling me this for a reason. Yeah. You're like, of course he's my supervisor and he's, and he's needs to do certain things to keep all of us safe and the public. But 
you know, he is recognizing, he likes my work ethic. He likes the results I'm getting, but he's critiquing me in ways to make me better, better down the future. Right. You know, and, and so next night, boom, pursuit. And we were, it was, it was a better, I think it was a, a stolen car. Right. So it was a little bit more of a want. Higher priority. Higher yeah. priority. But I mean, nowadays, you know, a stolen car in the it's middle of stolen it, car. It's a stolen car. I mean, <laughs> half the time they don't even get charged for the stolen car anyway. So yeah, what's I the don't point? even want to go there. Yeah, it it's craziness. <laughs> um, but so I canceled myself. You know, I was like, hey, you know, he's we're doing, you know, we're on inner city streets, man. Right. They're this big and we're hauling ass. And it's like, hey, 1022, I'm done. You know what I mean? Here and put out a BOL for SF or yep. whatever it is. Um, but after that. He didn't say a word to me, nothing. And I'm like, man, I'm really like, I, I was almost you expecting like a high five. Exactly. Or but it was actually better for me. You know what I mean? I, I really wanted that acknowledgement. Like, hey man, like that's awesome that you, that you took what I told you and you actually did it. But that was, that was the expectation. Yeah, you know? that's interesting. Yeah, so it's like, you don't have to have, look internally for that validation. Don't look outside of right. it. This exactly. guy already gave you his time. Exactly. Right. He already gave you the, the nuggets that you needed. Uh, you don't have to give you any more. Like, right. yeah. So you recognize that right away or does that take some time? I think, I think I was like, you know, fuck dude, I, I would have expected a bigger reaction out of him. Mm -hmm. But now as I got into more shit, mm -hmm. he gave me kind of a longer leash. Mm -hmm. Let me kind of go a little bit longer. Cause he knew I had the ability to say, no, this is too much. You know, he trusted me with that. Mm -hmm. And you know, and it didn't have to be just pursuits. You know what I mean? It, it was everything. He wasn't so much worried about my, you know, when I did get on the radio and something was hot and it was like, Hey, I need, you know, I need help or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. He took that as like, okay, this is, yep. Anything you need, boom, go. Not to say that he wouldn't do that to anybody else. I or, got you. But there was a more of a comfortability with me being, you know, or he working for him. You. He trusted yeah. you. I showed him that, Hey, I'm trustworthy. I listened to what you're saying. I'm not going to coachable coachable. Yeah. That's, that's exactly what it is. You're coachable. Cause they, they dude, they want you to lead. They don't really give a shit what you're doing right now. It's all about what you're going to do Future. in five years, right. you know? And, and I, that's, a, that's one aspect of my agency that I, that I just, dude, I fell in love with that, you know? So, so how did that work out for you? So, I mean, these are all learning lessons that you're picking up again, you don't know what you don't know, right? right? Until you get there, you're doing that, you're going through, you're having this, sounds like very positive leadership. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's some challenging times along the way. Oh, definitely. Again, you're getting into probably some situations that require hands-on stuff and yeah. there, things can be questioned by the outside and you're having to deal with some stressful stuff. How does this work out for you as you get closer to that five to six year mark? Dude, it worked out great. Yeah. It worked out great. You know, I, I, you know, fast forward five years under my belt, I had already built a reputation for myself for being someone who was well-rounded. I was, you know, I, I made sure that I'm not just going to go hunt bad guys and then let everything else fall. Cause I could take a hundred people to jail. It's not going to matter. Yeah, It's not that cowboy shit. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and although the cowboy shit is fun and that's like, you know, you feel good when you're taking bad, bad people off the, off the street, but you can do that while you do everything else. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so, you know, taking care of your beat partner, taking care of your paper, being organized, you know, putting together a good case for when you go to court, you're good on the stand. This is the job. That's it. Cause there's, dude, like I said, there's so many things that are involved in law enforcement. Just the, just the beat cop, dude, you have five faces you have to wear, you know? And so it worked out great. Five years on, I, I recognized that, Hey, you know, pretty much all of our command staff is now looking at me as somebody that they trust. They want me to start training people. They want me to start taking, you know, I don't think it was that five years, but they want me to, they're talking about sergeant's tests. They're talking, you know what I mean? They're giving me people to train when FTOs aren't there. You know, how did, how did that feel, man? I mean, going back to the uh, feeling, the pressure coming in right with the family and the lineage and all right. that stuff that was there and feeling like, oh man, like those are big shoes to fill. How did it feel to kind of be at this point? Did you feel more pressure? Did it feel great? Did you know what to do with it? How did, how did that all go down? You know, it felt obviously good, you know, that I wasn't a fucking soup sandwich and, you know, I was a complete, <laughs> you know, idiot, but I still had that goal of being a canine healer. So right. I hadn't get, I hadn't okay. got there. So yet. that, that's where I was, that's pretty right. much the question I think I was asking. Right. Uh, yeah. But if, I haven't arrived yet because yeah. I haven't achieved my goal. And uh, it was just, it was still head down yeah. rolling. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, 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 so I started looking at, okay, now I'm at five years. I knew there was about five to six years before um, ultimately I would get the opportunity to test. 
I, it might've been a little less than five years, but um, I was like, okay, now I think I'm at the point where now I can start putting my own time into canine training, you know, showing up and I was working graveyard um, during the week and they would have maintenance training on Wednesdays, but that shit started at one. I, w I lived an hour away, mm. right? Like I would get late cases and then, you know, have to stay at work till 10, mm. sleep in my truck for three hours, dude. And I was straight to canine training for like a year, you know, and I put in a ton of time on my own, um, just showing up there. It's sacrifice and compromise. Yeah. yeah, man. And, you know, at this time I had my son, my wife was at home, you know what I mean? I could have very easily been like, dude, I ain't doing this canine shit right now. I'm going to go see my kid. Mm -hmm. um, but luckily my wife, you know, she's a freaking saint. She was like, look, and she was a um, uh, police 911 dispatcher for a local agency where we lived. So, oh, wow. so it worked out real nice. She understood. And, and plus when I first got into this, she knew it was canine handler. Like once that time comes, it's, it's, a, it's, there's nothing else. I got to do this. Mm -hmm. um, so I had all the support I needed, but it was still tough, dude. You know, like showing up there, I'd spend four or five hours there and then go straight into work, work graves and do that every day, every Wednesday. Um, that is a different kind of grind, man. We yeah. have that emotional over you. And then I don't want to put this, this part on the side because it's so important. When you're not sleeping, oh, I mean, dude. from a stress perspective, right. what that does to your body physiologically is like I, people just don't give it enough credit until they've been there. But I've said this a million times, talk to somebody that hasn't slept very well for three days. And you tell me what kind of a person that person is right. on day three or four that they're hating life Dude, and everybody cool. around them. Right. Yeah. It's just, be, that's, that's what your body is doing. Like it's just tired. It needs to recover. And he's, and now you have to go out and make split second decisions, right? You have to be on your game. You, you need to put the period where the period goes in the police report yep. or the whole thing goes out the window Right. Plus you're training physically. Right. And yeah. then, uh, you know, then you have to be a dad and a husband somewhere in there. There's a lot to that. So yeah. I don't want to overdo it. I'm just saying like, I don't think people give enough credit to the level of stress or how that the compilation of that stress happens over time and what it, what it can do. So no, I get you. And I know how important it is to have somebody on the other side going, Hey, listen, in a year from now, it's going to be way different. I got you. Let's hang in yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. So having a, having your number one fan there is super totally. important. Yeah. Totally. Gotcha. I mean, dude, I could tell you, I was, uh, there was times where I was writing reports and I'm, dude, I'm no scholar, right? Like I'm, I'm sitting there like trying to figure out yeah, my life. Yeah, you mentioned right? that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so dude, there was times where I'd fall asleep, dude, and just hit the M and there's like seven pages of M's, dude. <laughs> I'm like, fuck, now I got to delete all this shit. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? And, right. and but that's the, that's the grind. That's the grind, dude. Yep. And it worked, it paid its, you know, it right. worked out. It, and the one thing that I didn't realize is that all those handlers, cause we, we, you know, the whole, not the whole County, but there was a ton of handlers that trained in this, in our training group from all different agencies. And what it did was it showed them that I was willing to put in this work and that ultimately like, you know, maybe let's look at this kid cause he deserves this. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? But none of them allowed, none of them told me this, which was great because I, you know, it would have given me like, oh, I'm good. And maybe it would have allowed me to back off a little bit on that, on that own time I was putting in. Mm -hmm. um, but it, they recognized it, you know, and we're talking some of these, some of these handlers are on their like third dog, dude. They're like career canine guys who are like, I was looking up to, but I was, you know, picking their brain. Like, why do you do this? You know what I mean? And what's the benefit of doing it this way instead of that, mm -hmm. you know? And it, it was really cool because they were, you know, and canine dude, not, Every dog is the same. Some dogs got problems here. Other dogs got problems here, but I was able to watch them correct problems with the dog and the handler, you know, and, and, and then ultimately as a team. Yeah. Some going back to something I listened to you say earlier was kind of what the, I don't know. Did you tell me he was a federal agent? He was an unmarked car. It came out of a, a, a yeah, marked car. Yeah, he was he task was, force with a federal, federal agency. agency. Yeah. So the guy had told you, look, look, what we want is a, you know, a sergeant, um, a handler and there was another detective. and a detective yeah. all in the same thing. So now you just moved from being in the department with a lot of great people to now being in a training situation with people from multiple departments that are not just really good or great people. These are like, you're talking, this is like top gun, right? Right. In order to make it into this thing, it's top yeah. gun. And I don't think a lot of people actually like maybe realize that, you know, the, the canine officers, the guy driving the car, with the dog in the back or the, the, the female officer for that matter, driving the right. car, they don't just get, they don't just hand that shit out. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're talking about a cop who's had to cut their teeth has yeah. had to, has had to go through all kinds of stuff. And, and now you're getting the opportunity as that officer to step into that, that place and now soak up all that knowledge and wisdom yeah. in a very concentrated space. 
to accelerate everything very, very quickly. That had to, that had to have been a lot of fun, but at the same time, a little bit like eye opening, like, dude, did that feel like hitting the reset button? Totally. Like I'm starting all over totally. again. Dude, yeah. but it checked me at the door. You know yeah. what I mean? Like I came into it. I was, I've always been humble. I've never been one of those people that thinks I'm the biggest, baddest. Cause I'm fucking not, you mm. know what I mean? And I learned that from a young age. You know what I mean? I ran my mouth to the bad dude and he shut it real quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, when I, when I got in there, I was like, dude, I'm an established fucking cop. I only have five years on, but I'd been through a bunch of shit. I paid my dues. I, I showed people that, Hey, you know, I have this work ethic and I get results from my work ethic. Mm -hmm. But then when I got there, everyone did. Yeah. It's a blank were, Yeah. You're it's like, like, fuck, the, now I got to do this again. The playing field is leveled. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, dude, now I'm, I'm starting from ground zero. Okay. Um, but that time that I put in, I think I had like, Dude, it was like 600 hours of my own time that I put in to just showing up at canine training, like not even handling a dog, not even doing anything with dog. I'd wear a, I put a suit on every once in a while, but it wasn't, I, I wasn't there like chomping at the bit to put a suit on. I was more so of like, Hey, if you need me to put a suit on, no problem. Yeah, put me. In. But yeah. I was like, dude, I want to pay attention to why, you know, people are doing what they're doing. And, yeah. and, 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 you know, when you put the suit on, you learn a lot. You know what I mean? You can, I mean, you learn a shit ton when a dog's gnawing on your fucking arm mm -hmm. and you're like you're looking him in the eye and shit. Um, mm -hmm. But I was more so like, dude, I want to listen to the trainer tell this handler this and then watch the handler do it and mm -hmm. watch these, all these pieces kind of connect. Mm -hmm. And I think it paid dividends, dude. I watched that for 600 hours and then went into my oral board. Yeah. And I had already, you know, put in all this time. On so the you street. have the, yeah. So you have all basically all this knowledge already accumulated. You just don't have the practical application right. yet. So it's just yeah. putting that piece together. That's all it was. Yeah. And dude, I remember I, dude, I wrote an outline out. I, I had some idea of what they would ask me just based off talking to other handlers and stuff, but I didn't know. I mean, there's like, dude, there could be a question in there that I never prepared for. So I got to prepare for everything. Yeah. There's no Google or Google search or app no, for that. No. Yeah. And I, dude, I'd recite my answers and I had freaking flashcards on Again. Dude, going back, on, yeah. going back to the, the person that's driving the car that says canine on the back. This is the type of typically officer that you've got in the front seat. Obviously you can't make a blanket statement and say it's everybody. Right. But the ones that I know and the ones that I've been around that those are those people. Yeah. So again, going back to the sitting in front of the oral board and then I'm asking that, that ultimate question, you know, like, Hey, all these other candidates tell me why we should hire you. You want to be in that position where totally. I just gave you every answer to everything. I've mm -hmm. already seen all the training. I've already basically done all the training. You show, yeah. you tell me why I shouldn't have it. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And, that, and that was kind of the tempo of where Things my world going. went. Yeah. Great. You know? And it worked out great. You know? So you come on, so you become, so you, you achieve the ultimate, you know, goal that you had had. Yeah. Right. But you strike me as the type of dude that's, you know, that's probably short lived. Like, okay, now what's next? On to the next thing, dude. What, so what was next? Next was being a successful canine handler. Okay. You know, that's, there's a big, big piece there. You can have a dog and, you know, going back to that blanketed, you know, some people get into that position because they want that pin and they want to drive around with the dog and look mm -hmm. cool, you know, and say they're a canine handler, but don't necessarily put in the time and work that is needed to actually be successful on the street. There's a, there, there's more work in being a canine handler than I think anything I experienced in law enforcement, dude, fighting bad guys, chasing bad guys, trying to figure out my life on how to find bad guys. That was totally different, dude. Yeah. No, there, there was no comparison. No yeah. comparison. I, the other thing is, is that, and this is what I've learned on the show and from hanging around uh, kind of the community a bit is you're being pulled in a lot of different directions, right? Cause it's not when a canine gets, when a canine is called to a particular, a particular call, uh, the reason they're going is because there's something going down, right? right. So there, there has to be like a stepping back. There has to be like a complete observation. What's this, what, what's going on here? What do we have? There's a strategy piece. So there's a communication piece that has to happen. Oftentimes it's something that's happening on the way to the call. Right. And so it's not the, that tag is expired or that taillight's out. Let's right. go. Right. It's, there's all this other stuff that has to go into it. And you have to be able to communicate with all different types of people at all different, diff, you know, types totally. of levels. You're not in the car on your own. There's the dog obviously, but right. there's all this incoming that's, that's going on. I was, I was really um, surprised or taken back about all that. Plus now there's a use of force stuff that you have, right? You have right. another 
well, less than lethal weapon on board, right? right? In particular tool, let's say not, not weapon, but tool right. on board that has this whole other aspect to it in terms of decision-making and decision-making quote unquote under fire in the heat of the moment. So, um, you talk a little bit about like what your first kind of experiences were with the dog and getting into it. Yeah, man. Uh, <laughs> first of all, let's talk about the dog. Yeah. So, so you, how did this work out? So let's talk about how you got the dog. So did you know the dog you were getting or is it when you show up to work one day? Hey, we found you a dog. So actually my story is actually pretty cool. Like I, I, our head trainer was on my oil board, right. And he owns Trident canine and consulting. Okay. Out of South San Francisco. Shout out to them. They're freaking awesome. So is he an officer or is he, he was a, he was a sergeant at the time. Okay. So he, he had worked, I think, I think he worked three dogs in his career. Okay. Um, made this company and trained, you know, he's got probably, I don't know, 10 agencies that he trains. I mean, he, dude, he's a wealth of knowledge. He's got a couple other trainers that help him who are cops on the street with dogs. So, I mean, there you, it, it was nice to have working handlers who are your trainers too. Yep. You know what I mean? Cause they're, they're in the thick of it with you, mm -hmm. you know? And then, so he was on my, my oral board. Um, and funny enough, he was getting on a flight to go to Europe right after that. To get some dogs. To get some dogs. Um, so they didn't tell me that I got the, the dog spot for probably the next day. So he flew over there. They told me I got the dog spot. Well, fuck yes. Thank God. You right. know what I mean? Finally. But then it was short lived, dude. It was like 30 minutes of, oh, hell yeah. And then it's like, oh shit. <laughs> the reality oh, says that. Yeah, I'm getting a dog, dude. Oh man. <laughs> and then, so he's over there it's testing a ton of dogs for actually a couple other agencies too. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sitting on the couch, thinking it was a weekend. I'm watching cops, of course. And it's <laughs> <laughs> stupid. And, and so I remember I was sitting with my kid and I get this, um, it was, I think it was through the WhatsApp because he was in Europe. Uh, so I had he's to he's use texting you. Yeah, I got dude, it. And there was, four or five dogs pictures with like or videos, with like five videos, each him testing. And they, they, I think, cause I put so much time in that they included me in it, but it was very much so, Hey dude, it doesn't really matter what the fuck you think. Yeah. You yeah. Dog uh, we're we, just keep, yeah. we're just, you're, you can feel part yeah, of the team here. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So there was, but you're the noob. So shut up. Yeah. So you're going to get what you get, dude. Um, and, but all the dogs I was looking at, I mean, at that, dude, at that time, I didn't really know what, what you were going to take whatever you got. Dude, right? I didn't even, that's I didn't clear. care. Yeah. I had, yeah. I did not care. You trust your guys to get you the right, yeah. the right animal. And, right. but what they were like, what they did is they're like, dude, we're going to try to find a dog that kind of mimics you, what kind of cop you are, how active you are. You know what I mean? What you can handle. We're going to try to set you up with what we think would work. Cause ultimately he's looking at green dogs, dude. These are, I mean, they know how to bite a suit, but that's it. They don't even know how to. I didn't even know how to lay down, sit, nothing. No obedience. No right. obedience at all. Dude. They just train them right from the get go to, to yeah. bite stuff. Again, this is a thing that I've learned. Like I had no idea about this process until a few years ago. I had some ideas because people kind of clued me into a few things, but the process of getting, you can get one that's been very well trained right. and has no bite experience. Right? right. And then you can get one that's on the other end of the spectrum is just bite, just bites. That's all it right. knows how to do. And yeah. that's could be problematic Dude, yeah. uh, or whatever and no obedience. So right. what you get is what you get. You have to trust that the, the person picking that dog for you and their wisdom and their knowledge yep. and the interview experience they've had with their handlers, putting you in a, both in a good situation to be yeah. successful. And the other part about this is there's I'll not necessarily liability. There's a lot of finance involved in this. Oh, so yeah. nobody wants to screw this up. Right. So there's a lot going into this process and there's a lot of talent. And I think there's a spidey sense, you know, of the good ones. Right. And you're, yeah. you're working with a guy that's got that. And so totally. I think that's what you're allu alluding to. Is yeah. You got to get you the right dog. So how'd that work out? Dude, it worked out great. I mean, if <laughs> anyone who's listening, who knows my dog, dude, he's a spitting image of me. So, so yeah. straight ADD dude <laughs> yes. just can't sit so, still. So I met rolling. Tyke a few minutes ago, right? When you, <laughs> when you came in and he, you know, he's like, first off, he's, he's, he's a Mal. And so people that know Mal, there's, there's, a, there's some certain mannerisms that they have or whatever when they come but the dude's just switched on, right? you know, like his <laughs> eyes are big, ears are up. He's up on his toes and he's just, you know, kind of pulling around and he's in a new environment. So he's curious and all, right. just all the things he's taking it all yeah. in. Uh, but big eyes, right. just the big, big eyes. And then, uh, yeah. So He's a gorgeous guy. How, like he, how old is he now? He's four. All right. He's yeah. four. Yeah. All right. All right. In the Netherlands. And, and, um, dude, I, I think I still have his videos. Like you could, he, it just a drivey, drivey dog. Okay. Um, hard headed. Um, what does that mean? Dude, he doesn't go with the program at all when in the very beginning, <laughs> right. like it was not, so not a straight knockout fight with him all the time, but like, he's a strong willed dog. He's like, dude, I'm not, 
laying down for you. Dude, that, like, that sounds familiar. <laughs> sounds, <laughs> sounds like you, dude. <laughs> so, you know, when I, right, he goes over and they're like, what do you think? <laughs> on this group text, you know, what dog be like, what do you think? Meanwhile, on the back on the group text that you're not on, they're all right, laughing. Like, we don't give a fuck, yeah, dude. But they're yeah. all probably laughing going, this dude's gonna, <laughs> yeah. this dude's gonna get everything he asked for. Right. This is the dog. Right. Yeah. So his name was Dex. Um, and I'm all, dude, I really like Dex. They're all, holy shit. That's actually the dog we picked for you. Like wow. they were like, dude, that's the, that's the dog. I'm like, oh no, really? Yeah. Oh yeah, dude, we got him. We paid for him. He's coming in three days. Mike, right on. So, oh, well, hey, we land at this time at SFO. We'll meet you um, at another cop's house that was close to the, the the airport. And I get, I show up there. I'm super pumped. I'm like, dude, I get my dog. Like, this is awesome. And you know, this head trainer. And then um, I met my buddy, who's a um, handler for us. Mm-hmm. He's kind of our top handler. You know, what I mean, the most experienced one. Um, and they were very much so that old school, like, dude, this is your dog. We're going to teach you how to teach him, but we ain't going to do this for you. Mm-hmm. Like, this is what you signed up for. You're going to do the work. So they pop him out of his kennel, dude, put a leash on him. They're all your dog. <laughs> and I'm like, it's like okay. getting you a baby. Yeah, dude. Like, what the fuck am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> I'm like, uh, I'm like, and he's, he's, I mean, he's probably a little smaller at that time, um, but he's only 61 pounds. So he's a little smaller. He hopped out and I'm like, Damn, I'm like, all right, I expected him to be a little bigger. Yeah, well, Mike, I can tell you this for anybody that doesn't understand these breeds, like 61 pounds can feel like 601 pounds uh, when they're- Full body workout. Yeah, when they're ready to go. Yeah. So yeah. I can imagine. Yeah. And and him being a super hard, <clears throat> drivey dog, like it was, it's, he's a lot of dog. You know, he was a lot of dog. Did you guys have the love hate thing there for a while? Did you hate him? Did you want to give him back? <laughs> no, no, dude. <laughs> there I was didn't. never that. So like, I, you know, in the beginning, I get him, I throw him in the truck- I didn't really have a whole lot of time with him because I wanted to get him back home so that I could bond with, bond him. with him. Yeah. Um, but one of, one of our handlers is really close buddy of mine. He, he was like, dude, you're not going to handler school for like a month. And, and I was like two months, two months. So I want you to just literally work on your relationship with this dog. You know what I mean? Come to training. We'll do bite work. We'll do obedience. We'll do all that shit. But when he's at home, I want you to build a relationship with him. Don't be yanking on him and doing all this shit because you have no idea what you're doing. Mm-hmm. But I want you to build that, that foundation. Just between be a and dog him. owner. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah to yeah. a certain, and, and that's all I want. I'm like, all right. So I took that and, and really implemented that in, in the very beginning stages. And that's really, I think why me and Tyke worked so well together. So his name's Tyke now. It's Tyke. not Dex anymore. Yeah. Yet. So <laughs> where does that come from? Dude, hey, this is, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. So my uncle, his name's Mike. So when my dad was younger, he couldn't say Mike, he said Tyke. And so that was his nickname forever till today, dude, everybody knows him as that. And he was, uh, you know, he's not a cop. Okay. He's the, uh, quite the opposite. He's the black sheep. He's the black sheep, dude. So in and out of prison, um, his whole life, we're talking probably 41 years on parole, you know, collectively, um, did a, I think he did like two stints of like over 10 year wow. stint. So, you know, career guy. Mm. Um, but I always gravitated towards him. He's such a good dude. You know what? I'm not surprised by this yeah. at all. Going back to you pushing back as a younger <laughs> yeah, kid. Exactly. Like, you probably could have gone two routes. Right. 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 In the end, exactly. right? I came to that T intersection. Dude. Ended up like your, your uncle yep. or where you're at right uh, now. Dude, you have no, exactly. hundred percent. Right. Right, this is very, this is, yeah, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So he gets out of, he gets out of prison. Uh, I think it was about 2008. Mm. Um, had a couple of rough years, violated a couple of times, went back. Um, but I think it was about 2011, 2012, he got out and boom, changes his entire life, dude. Finally. Finally. And he's a motorcycle guy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that lifestyle, um, that's really hard to break yourself from that. Um, And he hasn't taken himself completely out of that, but just in kind of a different direction, right? Um, And so he's, Dude, he got married. He's got a step grandkid. He bought a house. He's got a great career. Like, dude, he just- Trying to get his shit together. Right. And in my career, I never even, I, dude, I don't think I know one person I arrested on the street that I knew who, that changed their life. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's, a, it's very few that happen, you know, that, that completely turn things around because it takes them deciding like, hey, no, I'm not going to live this life anymore. I'm mm-hmm. not going to do this. Um, and it's really hard to do. So- you know, knowing that now he's around family. Now he's at every barbecue. Now he's, you know what I mean? He's at every event, supports law enforcement like crazy because his whole, all his brothers, his Mm -hmm. nephews, everybody's in law enforcement. Um, So it had a real good um, 
mindset, man. He was like, you know, I fucked up. I, I, I did a lot of shit that I wish I could take back, but I can't. Mm-hmm. He's in his sixties, you know? And, and he was like, dude, for the rest of my life, I'm not going to live that life anymore. Mm-hmm. Boom. And changed it. And I was so like proud of that. Cause mm-hmm. I, cause I never I saw it. one. Right. So I'm like, dude, motorcycle guy, kind of career prison, dude. I'm like, dude, I'm going to name my dog after you, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and great. so, I don't know. I don't know how the chief felt about that. Cause he knew the story, I'm sure but, he did. Um, but let it go. And, and so Tyke wears a badge, dude. And it says Tyke and it has awesome. my badge number. Uh, my uncle's showing it to everybody. Dude, look, I got a badge, bro. Um, <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Man. And, and you know, like, but it was super cool on the street. People would ask me like, that's a unique name. Why'd you name him that? And you, you know? could tell them the turnaround story. And I tell them the turnaround story yeah. and they're like, and it brought a lot of humility and a lot of like normalcy to me. And the dog and law enforcement yeah. and whatever. I think that humanizing piece, yeah. like I've talked about with other people on the show before about how important that is. And we, we you brought up Ricky Rivera and what he's doing with his, with dude, his stuff. Stud. Yeah, stud. Holy uh, shit. Good That's, friend. I was telling you, I was like, dude, I gotta be the, I gotta be the next handler coming on after him. Are you yeah. serious? Icon <laughs> seriously sitting here for an hour and 45 minutes. Like, there dude. will not be another icon. No. Like, I mean, the, the dog is special. And so is Ricky. And, and yeah. one of the things he said was, um, you know, just, that the dogs bring a, a connection to community in one way or another and how important yeah. that is. And in, even into politics, you know, like when the, when the city council can pet the dog and see yeah. the dog, you know, yeah. who the dog is or have that story behind it. It's really important. So I, I think I can totally relate, And I think probably a lot of other people can too. So Tyke's, um, Tyke's a little bit of a knucklehead, right? Yeah. He's fighting you a little bit, yeah. but you go to work every day. You, you listen to your dudes um, that are in your corner and in your ear telling you how to do it, what what to do, what not to do, but not doing it for you. Right. And uh, how long how long are you in training? How long does Tyke or do you and Tyke have to spend together before you're actually out on the street? So you got, so <clears throat> I was lucky enough to have a little bit of time before, before we went to canine school. You said like two months there. So I had like two months and then we went to a six, uh, six week canine school okay. um, with DTAC canine up in uh, the SAC Romano. Yeah, I know about them. Yeah. Dude, phenomenal, phenomenal trainer. Um, did it just, it was awesome. It was a great experience for me. And then everyone there knows what they're doing pretty much. You know what I mean? Like they're battle tested with it. And, um, so I got that time with him before it prepared us a lot more because there was handlers there that got their dog two days before dog school, dude. Wow. Fresh out the plane, like in the truck, two days boom at school. So no bonding time whatsoever. Um, I mean, <laughs> you didn't really notice it because Tyke was fighting me every way. You know, like, you had, you had two months <laughs> with that dog. A, still being a knucklehead. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, we we match go to, made in heaven. We go to school, but it, the cool thing was, is they were like with my PD, like, hey, do you have this dog for two months? Bring him to work with you every every day. You work. We want the dog to come. You can't drive around with them. Seems totally appropriate. Man. Yeah. Like, yeah. why why would you not? Yeah. He's gonna be a cop dog. So, dude, you gotta get him oriented to it. Mm. Um. So I'd bring him in briefing, dude. And he'd sit in a chair right next to me. <laughs> Like, they're just like, dude. Um, and so every, you know, in between calls or in between stuff I do, I'd come back, let him out, walk him around, put him in the car, mm-hmm. start the car, put the siren on, just mm-hmm. kind of getting him, mm-hmm. you know, ready. Um, and then we went to dog school. Great experience. Six weeks of just, dude, it was canine shit. It was awesome, you know? Um, and we worked through some issues, you know? He, downing was super hard for him. Like he was just like, I ain't doing I don't want to stay there. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to lay down for you. So we had some beefs, some battles, some battles. And, um, once we got over that, dude, he was, he was my buddy, dude. And he was, he was like, all right, dude, let's ride. And like, you know what I mean? Like, he's like, all right, I get it. <laughs> and, and I won't do that again. Okay. You're the boss. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, he was, he was real good on, um, dude, all he likes to do is find bad guys stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like dope for him. He's dual purpose narcotics and okay. Apprehension. Okay. Um, so, so he's, he can, he's, He's a search dog yeah. for, for drugs or yeah. narcotics and he, he's, on, he goes on bite. Yeah. Okay. So exactly. I just want to clear that up for anybody yeah. that may not know, yeah. know what you're talking about there. And like, he, you know, the, he was actually, I think he's the last dog we're going to do for dope. Um, everything else is guns. So the dual purpose, you can only do guns or dope or bomb or whatever, but mm-hmm. just, I mean, I think there's, there's no bite and bomb dog. You got to just have a straight right. bomb dog, you know, right. bite and explosives and shit. We've had them on before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, so I w- I was cool with dope. I, I was like, dude, this is a perfect tool for me and my team because dude, I love that's what you that. like finding. Yeah. yeah. So just take that shit off the street. Um, but he wasn't as motivated for the detection side. 
You know what I mean? Like he took a lot of drive to finding the bad guy and biting the bad guy, but then was kind of like, dude, this isn't that fun for me. You know it's what interesting. I mean? You're throwing me a ball and that's all I get, you know? So mm -hmm. it, you kind of had to push him a little bit to get through that. Mm -hmm. And once he did, he was great. He was, he was a great dope dog. He found a bunch of dope on the street. We were, we were good. Um, but, you know, after that six weeks, I come back. Now I'm on the street. And there's a transition period with the dog and me. You know, the dog's been doing scenarios and training for six weeks. And now it's real life. It's very planned. Yeah. yeah very structured. Yeah. And you yeah. know, like any handler out there will know, like when you, when you pull up to a training site, your dog's like barking and spinning. Right, they, they know. They know like, oh shit, this training. It's time to go to work. Yeah. So like Tyke took a little bit. It was like two weeks for him. I'd hop him out the car on a hot call and he'd be like, are we home? Like, what are we doing? Yeah. You know what I mean? And so we worked through that and then dude, it was off to the races. He worked great, you know? Um, not so much on tracking. He was kind of, he was kind of a knucklehead with tracking. He was just like, so there's no perfect dog, right? no perfect dog, dude. Right. No. And, 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 you know, other than honestly, icon <laughs> to be completely Again, honest with you, dude, never that, be another icon. dude, I saw that dog on this. I, when I was watching that episode, I'm like, yeah. man, I can tell you Tyke ain't going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm going to bring a crate. Yeah. Like, <laughs> um, so we hit the street. Um, dude, I remember my second day on the street. Okay. Um, we had a robbery come out of at one, um, I think it was a target or something. And dude pushed the old lady down and took off running. Well, I'm the dog guy. I'm like, dude, all right, let's go. Like, we got to set up a perimeter. I completely shit the bed with the perimeter set up. Um, okay. And I get out of the car and I'm like, all right, where was this dude? Like, where's the last time, last place they saw him? And he actually dropped a backpack. So I was like, cool. I got a little bit of scent. Got some, okay. Got something to work with. Dude, and I hopped him out. No long line. Just my regular six foot lead, dude. And I'm trying to run a track on a six foot lead on his pinch collar. With like, this which is, dog. With yeah. this dog, which is not what you do. Yeah. You're supposed to move them over to <laughs> like harness. The harness or, or, yeah. yeah. And so uh, it was a good learning experience okay. for me, obviously, but all even, the mistakes are being made right at one time. Right. <laughs> so, and of course, like I'm like, as I'm halfway through this track, I'm like, dude, I didn't say anything about a perimeter. I just now said, Hey, set someone up over here. And I'm like, dang, dude, I know this, but when you're you know, I, I mean, I was like, Oh, this is my first dog call, dude. Let's if go. This goes back to, there's so many more things yeah. going on, right? It's yeah. like starting over dude, yeah, and when, it's, start when you become a handler, the first, I'd say year, maybe even two years, dude, you're just trying to get comfortable with what you're doing. Cause you have so much responsibility on your plate with so many different aspects of just what used to be simple. Mm -hmm. Well, not simple, but what used to be easier. Cause you're, although you may be in a position as a regular cop to set up perimeters and, and kind of delegate different types, types of things, with a dog, you're, you're doing that while you got to hold onto a leash at the very tip of the front of this, you know, party where you're the spear, yeah, yeah man, you're, so you're rolling. So I, I screwed all that up. I knew my lieutenants were, were listening. And I'm like, God, they're going to give me so much shit for this, you know, I'm like facts. But I was like, I can't get down on myself right now because we're in the middle of it. So let's just, we got to just work. We got to work through this. Well, Tyke was actually tracking, dude, same way he went. There were surveillance cameras that caught this dude hopping a fence in the same direction that we were gone. Um, but we called off the search. Dude was long, long gone, hopped in a car and took off. Okay. Um, but as I'm walking back, I'm kind of hard on myself. I'm like, dude, you screwed this up, you know, but teachable moment again, yep. you know, it's like, all right, cool. Next time I ain't going to make these mistakes. And my Lieutenant comes driving by and he rolls down the window and he's like, you think you should have a couple cops around here? Or I'm like, right. yeah. He's like, all right, cool. Just shreds off. And then, and then uh, <laughs> I was like, all right, yeah. got it, you know? Yeah, point taken. Yeah, right. so, and then it was a couple other incidents like that. You know, there was a couple more fumbling the ball, you know, not really doing what I was supposed to do. Fortunately, on the next one, I had a real senior handler from another agency with me as part of my search. Okay. And he was my lethal cover during this search. And uh, we we actually pull up same time. And we kind of had this unwritten rule where it was like, dude, senior handler, you're you, gonna, take you, the, you take, take the, the lead. Yeah, he was super cool. He's like, hey, dude, yeah, this is your fourth day. He's like, you want to get your dog a bite? I'm like, yeah, let's find some bad guys, dude. He's like, get that thing out of the car. Let's roll. I'm like, damn. I'm like, cool. All right. And so I get the dog out and I just take off. And he's like, come here, dude. <laughs> yeah. what? Wait, wait, time he's out. Like, what? I was expecting him to go, okay, never mind. Put that dog in the back of the car, dude. Let me get mine. Um, but is this the arm around you moment? Type arm of thing? around me moment. Totally. Yeah. And so we do this search. It was a huge, um, like open space. It was like a huge community garden with a bunch of outhouses, generators going on, pitch black dark. Um, and this dude had been 
I think he was, he was another robbery suspect, but he had been hit in different places and was kind of all over the city. Like we were, we were kind of just catching up, you know, never really on top of him. And we were probably five minutes after this dude took off running, he was shredding clothes as he was gone. So I'm like, all right, this is going to be a little easier now because his path of flight, he's now thrown clothes. He's on. leaving you, a, he's leaving you yeah, a, he's crumb, a bread totally. trail. Yeah. So I, I mean, all in all, we search everything, don't find him, you know? And that handler actually pulled me aside and was like, Hey dude, you need to do this. You need to do that. And after he was, this was done, after he's was taking done. notes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's not really saying anything. Even like it's an after action report, right. like on the side right. there. Yeah. And while we were going, he was like, Hey, think about this, do this, you know, very minimal. But afterwards he actually was a little stern, dude. He was like, Hey, like, this is what you're going to do. Again, this is the leader driving the canine unit. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so very fortunate that he pulled me aside that night. And luckily it was only like my fourth day with the dog. Cause it, it changed like it. I was like, okay, I need to start not getting so ahead of myself. And, and, you know, to the point where I can't reel it back and this whole thing's a shit sandwich. Mm -hmm. Um, so from there we, we, we really, I slowed things down. I was like, all right, I need that's, to do so this, 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 this. That's this. interesting and slowing, yeah. being able to do that, having the ability to slow it right. down. Do you find like as a canine handler, do you have to slow it down even more than you would slow it down maybe as an, as a cop on the street or. Yeah. In, yeah. Yeah. Up front, up front. And in in mostly when you're, when you're newer, you got to really slow it down a little bit. Cause that's so it's going to be hard to do. Throw oh, yeah. it back. It's going to be tunnel vision like yeah. crazy. Cause all you want to do is find the bad guy, show the rest of the team. <laughs> I, this dog works. This dog's for you, not just me. Yeah. You know, so there's pressure with that too. Um, but you know, we we were kind of off to the races. You know what I mean? And in good searches, he had good control off lead. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily where I wanted him at that point, so I would keep him on a long line most of the time. Yep, there's nuance to every dog, right? Dude, you run into so many problems with that long line, like yeah. just tangled and everything's dragging chairs, and mm -hmm. you know, you got to in the middle of a search cut him off. And say, all right, dude, we're now you're just strictly on e-collar and hand signals and stuff. So, um, he did, he did real well, man, you know? So I, I think this is, this is probably a good point to transition because what we've, and I've listened to you talk about is how hard you've worked, how meticulous you've been, um, how you've taken feedback, the feedback, well, the feedback that you've been given critical, you know, thinking type stuff, um, the leadership that you've had, uh, along the way. Uh, again, achieving the goal of becoming a canine handler, going through that whole process, which is a whole different process in and of itself as a, as an officer, you're, you know, I think we're, we're probably like six, seven years into your career as an officer now, right? That's a lot of time under your belt, yeah. given everything you said. And I, I guess I'm just trying to, we're just trying to um, unpack kind of who you are and what you've been doing because things get a little hairy for you. And you've got all of this stuff that you've been doing and how you've been handling yourself um, along the way. And you can, what, what I want to ask you about is a couple of incidents that you've, you've been involved in that you share with me before. And I'll let you tell us, you know, just get right into it wherever you want. You can start and finish wherever you want. But for me, I didn't have the context um, that you just spent time giving me when I heard the, the stories. Um, now having though that context, I have a whole different level of understanding of who you are, are and how you handle yourself, which then brings way more depth. And I think I have some serious questions about the stories that I've heard, um, that I want to get into to it with you on. So maybe you can just kind of talk about some shit that went bad, man. Yeah. And kind of give some people some perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, there was a, uh, a few things in, in my career that I, you know, was involved in that, you know, it was, it was fucked up. I mean, there's stuff that stuck with me that I didn't necessarily even feel that stuck with me. Um, and I got 2017, um, I was involved in a critical incident and it was a, uh, in custody death. So we were fighting this dude, like, I mean, knockout, drag out dude's been up probably a week on meth mm. and three cops and the other two much bigger, much better shape prior military guys. Like, you know, and we were, we were behind on this. Like this dude was fighting all three of us, um, in this living room in this house and kind of a weird note. There was a gallon of milk on the, um, the mantle right above the fireplace. 
Okay, and weird I, place to store your milk. Right, right, weird place to store your milk. So he throws me up against the the fireplace. And dude, the gallon of milk's open and it falls. And it's like drenched me in milk. The milk's all over the floor, hardwood floor. We're slipping in it. It's nasty, oh, man. dude. When shit goes bad, it goes dude, bad. And this dude hadn't bathed himself in like a month. So it was like, throw that on top of milk and fighting this dude. It, it was just, it, it was a good one, you know? Um, so we're fighting and I've, I, I'm, I'm, I got his right arm and we're trying to put him in handcuffs and he's just, dude, he's, he's, he's wrong. Not no, it. not at all. So my buddy tased him you know, you're going to get tased and, uh, excited delirium heads and he dies, Wow. you know? So it's my first real incident that I've been involved in where someone passes away. Right. And now I get my first kind of look into what happens after, after that kind of internally within the police department. Um, and so we're all sequestered. Yeah. Which um, is the first thing that happens, right? When yeah. one of these things happen, you, you go to cars, rooms, whatever, yeah. not supposed to talk to anybody or, right have any conversation about this incident at all until the investigator gets there. And it's a hard, it's a hard thing. You're alone. You know, you're, after you're, this, you're either, right? I had somebody with me, but it was like, you know, we're talking about the giants game, dude. And I'm like, like I dude, we're talking about the giants yes. game. Like, like right. the media is going to get hold of this. It's going to be nuts. Cause at this time, the, it, the cop stuff was still there, you know, like I, it, it wasn't as bad as it is now, but I knew like, this is going to be a, this is gonna be a road. You know, and, and so we go through that. There's a bunch of media coverage on it. We had a little protest, you know, and the things people were saying started to affect me a little bit. Um, and then we ended up getting sued and we're, we're dealing with that for a year. And then that dissipated, right? Then that's gone. And there was other incidents that happened in, before that, um, that I obviously I prepared myself for it, right? Um, but didn't prepare myself for what was going to happen after. after. Um, you know, I fought this dude with a gun and he's, he's got it in his windbreaker jacket he's not wearing a shirt and it's open. I have him on the hood of the car and I'm holding him down and I'm, I got my hand, my left hand on the revolver. He's trying to pull it out. And I'm like, you know, I, I'm running out of options on what I can do here. So I pull my gun out and I point it literally at his face. I'm like, dude, if you, if you pull the gun out, I'm going to shoot you. Like, it's that simple, dude. Just stone cold look, dude. Didn't he blink, didn't care. Didn't care. And I remember I had to transition and put my elbow on the hood of the car. Now I have my gun kind of to the side of him. Oh, and I'm like, dude, I got no room to really fuck around with you right now. Like I'm, this is happening. Well, the initial officer who was searching him that this dude took off running from, he's running towards, he's running towards us to help me. You know, Let he trips, guess. he trips and falls and he ends up screwing up his knee for like a year. Like got an actual knee injury, blew his knee out. And so he trips, he falls and his head lands right next to bad guy's oh my head. God. So I'm, I've already made the decision to shoot him because the gun, I, when I look down, I see the gun coming out. So I have a hold of it, but I'm like really only holding the barrel, like the, the very small barrel of this revolver. And I'm like kind of slipping a little bit. I have a good, you know, hold on it, but I'm like, dude, this is not good. So I'm decisions made. And by the way, this cop's on the same side of the gun or the, the, Suspect's gun. No, he's on the opposite side. Okay. So he's on the opposite side and I've made the decision to shoot him. So I'm like, dude, my finger's on the trigger. Like I'm, I'm there. Mm -hmm. And now his head is right next to his head. All yeah. I can see is dude, if I shoot this dude and it you goes through and I just shot my partner and that right there will transition to the next critical incident that I talk about. Cause it's pretty much the same thing. Um, okay. so, so that after that, whoa, 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 how did this, how did this end? Oh, how did it end? Yeah. yeah we should probably tell that. Um, <laughs> So once I see his head there, I'm like, nope. I holstered real quick and I punched dude with my right hand, which kind of didn't really do much to him. It just kind of, you know, stunned him, stunned him a, a second. And I threw, I threw his hand out of his jacket. I think he just kind of let go a little bit. A gun goes flying out on the ground and I just dump him on the ground, put him in handcuffs and we're done. That obviously that incident wow. stayed with me for a little bit. Right. I was afterwards, I was like, that was a close call. You know, so first off, guy's got a gun, you could have been shot. Then right. you have to make the decision to potentially shoot somebody. And then all of a sudden, if I shoot this guy, I'm also going to kill yeah, my partner, my partner. Yeah. The potential. And, and sure. so now I have to go completely reverse yeah. the process again. It's just the uh, and, heighten, had to bring it back down to here and then kind of go back up to in that seconds. in seconds. And then it was the conversation I had with bad guy afterwards that really 
it didn't screw me up. It just kind of solidified how serious this job is. Um, so I put him in the car dude, and, I, and he was a ghost town gang member out of Oakland. He was, he had a CDC warrant. Um, he was a parolee at large. So he was, he was on the run for a little while. That gun, uh, was using a homicide in Oakland. It was stolen. So I put him in the car. We're driving. He's looking out the window, I'm driving back to the station. So you don't know any of this though. No, I, I know, you, this know now. you know, the rap sheet, but you don't know. The, right. So I knew he had a warrant. You don't know about the gun. You don't know about the gun. I knew about the warrant. I'm like, obviously that's why he, he he's he, running. He's running. He didn't want to go back to prison. So, okay. I get that. So we're driving back and then, you know, I look him in my rearview mirror. He's looking out the window and drive again a little bit. I look at the mirror. He's looking straight at me and he goes, you're one of those young cops, huh? I'm all, yeah. He goes, were you going to shoot me? I go, yeah, I was. He goes, good. Cause I was going to shoot you too. And I, it, it just went like, all right. Whoa. You know what I mean? Cause it, it just, it solidified that I knew what he was trying to do, but he didn't, he didn't use any words, right? It was just his physical actions with the gun. But then he told me straight to my eyes, like, dude, I was going to do that. I'm like, all right. Shit's intense. Man. And then, and then it was like, he was super cool afterwards. And he was like, go ahead, bro. No problem. I'll get out of the car. Like I'll be cool with you. And or seemingly like, anyways. Seemingly. Yeah. You know, but these, you know, someone's been in and out of prison. Probably they don't before, have right? a lot to lose, man. Yeah. yeah so, you know, incidents like that. Um, there's a couple other ones, but um, April 7th of 21 um, was really the, the incident that that kind of ended really everything for me. So they say there's a like in law enforcement or even like in the fire service, everybody has like a career incident. Like there's always one. But for people that do things like you are doing, like as a canine officer, or maybe you're in like a, a in some type of a special team that could even be in like the fire service for that matter, where you're doing like these really dangerous rescues or recovery right. type operations or whatever. You don't have one career incident. You can have multiple oh, yeah. career incidents yeah. versus, you know, average, you know, one per, per person. So we're, we're, or April, 2017. So this is a few years ago. This was almost, I mean, yeah, the, 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 well, the 17 was the, um, okay. was the in custody death critical okay. incident. Um, the fight in the gun was actually fighting to do with the gun was actually before that. I think, um, if I remember it was, it was in there, a similar time before fight. the canine officer. Uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, so yeah. before you got tyke, yeah, okay. all everything, every, so this is cumulative. Yeah. Like yeah. every major traumatic incident I was involved in besides the, the April 7th, 21, um, officer involved shooting happened with no dog. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and it's funny that you, you touched on some, some fire stuff, you know, they, people don't understand that, you know, a lot of the times law enforcement gets to fires before mm -hmm. firemen even get there. And I had an incident where house was on fire, old ladies inside, like her husband comes out, he's on fire. Like his oh, shoes man. are on fire, his, his shirt's on fire. Um, and I'm thinking in my head, like, you know, my grandma, I'm not gonna, like, I can't let this lady burn alive. So we get there first. And, uh, me and two other cops were like looking at each other, like, dude, we gotta, we gotta go in here, which is going to suck. Cause this is this whole house, the whole top floor is engulfed, but thank God the front door was already open. Cause if it hadn't been opened, I probably wouldn't have popped that door because of all that uh, the backdraft. backdraft. Yeah. And so I could see in and I could see the flames pooling on the roof, like of that second level. It's, under just, the first. So it's, just it's about to, yeah, it's yeah. about to come down. So I asked her, her husband, I'm like, where is she? Like, what room is she in? He's like, one on the right. Well, there's like four rooms on the right. I'm like, dude, I don't have time to, to deal with him and get this information out. So we run in, me and one other cop, we run in, check one room, not there. Go to the next one, we see her. And well, she's bedridden. She's, oh. dude, she can't walk. And she's large. Big lady. Big 300, 400 pounds. Like it, it was, so I didn't, I couldn't even see that. I couldn't see her. All I could hear is her voice because the smoke was getting super bad. So I stand her up, but she can't, she lost, I think, use of her legs for some other injury. So she falls straight to the ground. So now I can't get her up. Me and my buddy can't get her up. So we have to drag her. Well, in the city I worked, these houses, we're talking city, city. So they're, they're narrow hallways. Every house is they straight, go straight up. up. Yeah. yeah. It's like three floors. Yeah. So we're trying to drag her through this, through this super small um, hallway. And it was taking a long time, you know? So I remember we were taking breaks running out of the house, getting air and then coming back in oh, to get her. Is she conscious or unconscious? She was in and out. She was in and out. But I mean, one of the crazy things that are always sticking in my mind, she had a little chihuahua 
dude, that thing was surfing on her back while we were pulling her. Wouldn't she was like her. fucking, yeah, the thing's laying down looking at me as we're, as we're pulling this lady out of this oh, fire, Jesus. dude. I'm like, yeah, dude, Something when shit wild. goes left, yeah, it goes you, way you couldn't left. couldn't write this shit, right? Bro. So we get her out and it took, a, it took a while. Me and my buddy were in the hospital for smoke inhalation for, you know, a couple hours. We get one day off and we're right back at it. Right back onto the you know? street. But I, I remembered everything I'd been involved in, dude. I was just like, I'm going to, I'm just not going to think about it and just keep on going, keep pushing, keep pushing. And my dad told me an analogy. My dad went to the um, FBI Academy, um, National Academy for like, if you want to be a chief, you go to these things in, in, in uh, Quantico, Virginia. And he comes back. And then after this April 7th incident, afterwards, I was talking to him. He tells me this analogy. And I've heard you talk about it a little bit with like, you know, glass half full. Mm. And as soon as it blows over, he told me a little bit of a different one that really resonated with me. Where he's like, dude, when you start your career in law enforcement, it's a backpack. It's empty. All the incidents you go through are rocks. And when you, you don't deal with them, you throw in your rocks in your backpack. Sooner or later, it's going to get so full that that last rock you put in there, it's going to rip at the bottom and all your rocks are going to fall out. And now you got to pick them up. And that's the hardest thing to do because you can't put them anywhere because your backpack's got a big ass hole at the bottom of it. It's a mess. So it's a mess. So, you know, and there was a more, I can't even, I mean, there was more things that happened that I just, dude, pushed right on by. Just cumulative stress. Yeah. And dude, you're numb. You know what I mean? Like it, when, when you do enough years on this job and you do it with really hunting and finding bad guys and putting yourself in these situations, your emotions are, are gone. And, and I hate to say this, but I'm, I'm going to be honest about it. Um, when you need to show sympathy and empathy and all that, you're faking it. Most of the time you're, you're just making them putting feel, on the hat. put on the hat because you're dealing with this every day, multiple times a day. You don't even, I, dude, you don't feel that anymore. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like so a robot. it's a robot. And that's what drives me nuts. When people say we don't want our cops to be robots. Well, unfortunately, that's exactly how what else. Are. Right. And then you give us a margin of error of zero. Like we're human beings, we make mistakes. It, uh, You've already articulated that right. several times. So, you know, I, I, I didn't deal with any of my shit. You know, I, I didn't, I, I didn't even think I had shit, you know, and, and yeah, you, you know there's no I mean? awareness to it. No or awareness. At least a, there may be some awareness, but, uh, but you're, you're just putting that lid on tighter right. on that or yeah. just keep stuffing rocks into that backpack. You're exactly. not acknowledging Dude. it. And that's a, it's, it's, that's all it is. You're just trying to push those rocks down to fit that next one in. And about, Two months before the shooting I was involved in, um, I started kind of- This is a different shooting. No, it's the April okay. 7th one. Okay. This, it's a couple months before this, I started noticing things where I was like, dude, I'm, I'm angry. I'm, I'm a little depressed. I'm, I'm got anxiety with things that I never really had anxiety with before. Um, and people started noticing. You know, I, I went, I remember, dude, it was about a month before, maybe even shorter time period. Um, I go to the courtyard to get gas in my car. And one of my sergeants is sitting there putting gas in his car. So I get out shooting the shit with him. And he's like, dude, are you all right? I'm like, dude, I'm fine. fine what are you dude. talking about? Fine. You know, he's like, well, I hate that word. I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah. Uh. And about a, I don't know, a week before I had this ride along and me and my buddy were talking shit in the, in the report writing room, you know, cause with this day and age, there's certain things at your agency that you used to do that you can't do anymore. It's the way it is. Right. Like, chasing cars and all that shit. Mm -hmm. So bad guy hunters, right? They're, they get pissed at that because that's what they want to do. You know? So we were kind of talking shit like, man, this sucks. Like this is bullshit. We're going to, you know, we were joking around. Like we're going to go get hired with San Jose PD where they can chase. I don't know if they, can <laughs> but, like, but, but, but uh, it was, uh, yeah, I don't know anything about that, but I'm going to guess it probably would have been a bad right. decision. Right. <laughs> but it, it was, it was in that context is the, the, I hear you the shit talk yeah. that we were doing. So that's me talking, but shit. I was doing it. It, I was doing it in front of this ride along who had already been hired by us. You know, they were just waiting to go to the, the Academy. So my sergeant's sitting in the sergeant's room and he is hearing all this and he is actually talking with us. And we were kind of talking shit to him about all this jokingly because we're all, we're all buddies. And, um, he brought that up. He's like, what, what do you like? There's something wrong. Cause you're not normally like that dude. And, and you're doing it in front of somebody you shouldn't be doing it in front of. And you're kind of salty a little bit. And so I'll make sure you're all right. And then I actually told him, and yeah, dude, there's actually some things that I've been dealing with a little bit, you know, like, I, I don't know why, I don't know where it came from, but I do feel it. You know, I, I definitely feel it. It was starting to trickle into my personal life, my family, my oh, wife. It always does. Yeah. And, and so, manifesting all kinds of different things. Yeah, so. Oh, totally. 
Totally. And he actually gave me a phone number for, um, you know, counselor that we had used throughout, um, within our police department. And he okay. told me like, Hey, there's a couple of cops who are talking to this lady and it's really helping them. Like, here's the number, call them, take some time and get yourself right. I'm like, all right. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as he leaves, I'm all fuck. sure. You know yeah. what I mean? Through Just that goes shit. in the, in the backpack. Yeah. And so it's funny to think about that now because like three weeks later I get in, I'm involved in a shooting and everything falls out, you know? So let's move into that. Um, keeping in mind, I think you sort of set this up like this incident that you've already been in with the guy with the windbreaker and the gun and him, you know, how hairy that got right at that, at that point. And then having to go, like you go, you book the guy and you go right back to work, right? Go right, right. back out on the street, same day, yeah. right? Same day. And then all this other stuff is starting to accumulate. So why don't you walk us through kind of what this final sort of incident was? Yeah. Um, you know, so it was, dude, it was a normal day. I mean, that's kind of how most of these things start out. It's like, dude, it's just another day at work. Um, and it was a Wednesday. That's my canine training day. So it's, it's funny. Sometimes canine training, I was like, fuck, dude, I want to be working on the street. Like I, I got a ton of drive right now that I want to go find bad guys, but I got to go to canine training for five hours. You guys always train on Wednesdays. I know. Everybody, it's, they it's, all do. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So I only had like, once, once briefing was over, I only had about an hour before I had to go to training. Okay. So I'd always be like, I want to get a hook. I want to arrest somebody before I go to canine training. That way I already have one when I get back and then I can just go straight to work after that. Maybe get another one. I got two for the day. And, um, so I'm, you know, I'm getting gas in my car, like my normal, I, I didn't do a normal routine. I switched it up and stuff. Cause you don't want to be in the same place every same day. Same time, yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm getting gas. I pull out of our corp yard. I let my dog out, um, breaking him. And I, I, I was eating like a granola bar or something just before I actually went into service and, and actually went and tried to find something. And, uh, so I, I put the dog in the car. I drive down this little driveway and I turn right, but they're doing, I think they call it slurry seal. It's like the cheap way. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. They just dude, throw some just black just, shit over the top. So dude, in, a, in a month you'll have to redo it again. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so there are cones everywhere, dude, traffic everywhere. I'm like, God, of course. Like, mm -hmm. I just want to go to work and I got to sit through this traffic just trying to get to someplace. Like, you know, so I was super irritated with that. So I'm, I'm driving up this, this road in this area where I'm at, dude, we're there every day. Cause that's where our little gas station is. Mm -hmm. dude, we know this, this part of this neighborhood is super familiar with us. A couple bad guys that live on it, but there's a hundred cop dude. cars driving through there a day. Yeah, yeah. We know everybody there. You know what I mean? Not a lot of problems at all in this area. Um, so I, instead of going straight where all this traffic was, I bang a right and try to go around it. Um, and so I quickly make the right. And this is the neighborhood that I know, dude, I've traveled down here every day. Mm -hmm. And I see this truck, this white Chevy truck, and it's kind of parked at an angle, kind of screwed up, blown out tire, toolbox up, driver's doors kind of open a little bit. And I caught it out of like the corner of my eye. You know what I mean? Cause I was just not really- You were I, I was, going somewhere. Yeah, it dude, wasn't was, there. You were headed exactly, somewhere. Yeah, exactly. I, I look and I see dude and it, it, he was tattoos and he's kind of slumped over the, the steering wheel. He's like fully like kind of head slumped down. Like almost unconscious. Right. Yeah. It, it, that's what initially came to my, to my okay. mind. So I drive by him and I'm like, hey, a lot of times, you know, a little context, a lot of times cops try to talk themselves out of what they see. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They're like, nah, dude, that, that wasn't that. You know what I mean? But you can't not act because my luck, dude, there's going to be a camera sitting there and sees me look and see him and drive right on by and don't even care. You know what I mean? But you also want to make sure that the dude's not dead. And if he is almost dead, you can give some, some Babe. medical attention to him and save him. You know what I mean? So I end up flipping a U-turn coming back and, um, I wanted to, to get the plate first because this truck looked out of place, dude. I never seen it before. It just kind of something in me was like, dude, trip that plate real quick just to make sure it's not stolen or something. And you just walk up to it. Like it's nothing. Right. So I trip it and it comes back as a recently recovered stolen out of San Francisco. Well, the area where it, where it's registered to is a bad area. And I knew that area. And I'm like, mm. just something to keep on my mind. Like I, nothing gave me, I didn't see nothing that'd be like, mm -hmm. oh, they're up to something. You just know you got a guy slumped over in the front yeah. seat in a previously stolen truck from a not so great area. Exactly. You sort of put the pieces together. Right. I mean, this is a critical thing. Cause you, I mean, you're, you're trying to get as much information up front before you mm -hmm. get yourself into something so that you're better prepared. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it's on the fly and you, you gotta do what you have to do. But so I turn around again 
I mean, and, and keep in mind, I was super nervous about this because now I've driven by twice. So if it wasn't someone slumped over and if it was someone up to no good, now they've seen me. Now they know I'm there. Now I'm behind the ball a little yeah, bit. Element of surprise yeah. in theory. Yeah. So I, I flip around again. I get behind him. I get out of the car. Well, I key my mic to tell him, hey, I'm on a stop. And there's, and there's, I think he was someone on training and they're, they're <laughs> reciting someone's name phonetically and it's taken forever. Oh. It's just like this drawn out name and it's so it's like long. Zachary dude, and they're going and they're through like every, yeah. pausing after every single, <laughs> I'm like, dude, so I, yeah. I'm out of the car now and I'm walking up and I, no one knows where I am. Okay. And this is a no, no dude. Like right. this is, you, you, you don't want to do that because if some happens, no one's going to know. So what's the, I mean. What should you have done? Just waited for newbie to get through his little thing. And well, then see, there's no, there's no, like you need to do this or this. Okay. There's gray in it. Thinking back though. Right. Thinking back. I don't think I would have changed it. Okay. Knowing what I know now. Okay. Right. Cause I would have been a sitting duck and I and ultimately kind of was, but at this point I was in my car okay. and sitting in my okay. car. So, um, so I get out and it also kind of comes in with your comfortability again. Right. How many, you know, if you have a bunch of experience in law enforcement, you've been through a bunch of shit, you're comfortable with yourself, you know what you're doing. You tend to have a little bit more confidence when you're in that situation. Gotcha. And, I, and I was confident. I'm not going to sit here and lie that that wasn't my first time jumping out and stopping it's outside. It's not your first rodeo. Right. Like I, I stopped cars without getting on the radio before. I've been told don't do that. And here I am in the situation, but I have to, because this dude, if he's dead, I'm not going to stay. I'm not going to sit right here and just wait. Like right. I gotta, I gotta do something. So I walk up. And I kind of opened the door a little bit and dude's looking right at me. I'm like, so he comes to, yeah, or like, seemingly comes to. Yeah. You. Yeah. So I'm, I didn't expect that. I, I expected him slumped over. Um, I'm all, Hey man, are you all right? Like I saw you kind of slumped over and I want to make sure you're okay. And he very quickly is like, Oh yeah, I'm fine, dude. I'm fine. And he started, he's getting nervous. Yeah. yeah. I'm looking around the trucks. Plain view is like the best thing ever, dude. I'm, I'm everything in plain view. If I see you, while I'm talking to you and it's illegal. Boom. Now you're, now you're detained. And I was real big on that plain view stuff. Um, so I kind of opened the door a little bit more to see who else is in the car. Cause I didn't see anybody else when I drove by and there is dude sitting in the passenger seat and there's a female in the back seat and female in the back seat's moving around. I can hear her digging through something. And I'm quickly was like, Hey, put your hands on the, on the headrest front, right. Passenger was the nervous. Uh, I, I mean, it was more than nervousness. It was like, something is up. Like my hair on the back of my neck, dude. Boom. I knew within me somewhere that it was like, Hey, you need to pay attention to this dude. Something is not right at all. And I remember he's wearing blue latex gloves and he was, he was, I'm like, that's kind of odd. You know what I mean? Like no one really wears gloves in the car. Like, yeah, you know, so I see in his hand, this is front right passenger. I see in his hand, he's got a meth pipe in his hand and okay. he's, and he's super nervous. And, and, He's got tattoos all over his neck, tattoos on his face. And these tattoos, I knew from working. I was just going to say, you got tattoos all over your arms. So give right. context to this. What do you mean? Right. So, you know, thin lining, you can tell it was a prison tattoo. Okay. It wasn't, it wasn't all, you know, he paid a thousand dollars for it. This was like CD player, you know, fucking trading Cheetos for it. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and so I, I picked up on these things. Not, not to say like I knew dude was bad because he's got a prison tattoo. You know, my uncle. I'm not going there, there with you, dude. Right. Like you've been a cop for a long time. You didn't just fall off the turnip truck. You've been in some shit. Right. You, you're, hey, look, man, you, you got the experience. I right. got you. I, dude, my uncle done many years tattoos. I forgot about that. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, so you got it. It was just something for me to kind of keep up on my head. Like, Hey, just pay attention. You know, like something's up here. Well, he's got a meth pipe and latex gloves on. Right. Like already we're. In and he's, he's wiping his face going, fuck. Fuck, oh, okay. fuck. And I'm like, hey, dude, relax. You know, if it's the meth pipe, dude, it's California, bro. I could probably go buy you a new one and give it to you at this <laughs> point. You know what I mean? And so I'm like, dude, just relax. It's all good. And I'm trying to like, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to deescalate him a little bit. Like, I just need, I just need time because I need one to tell people where I'm at. No one knows I'm here with you right now. And I'm formulating a little bit of a plan. I'm kind of stalling a little bit, talking, kind of shooting shit with everybody in the truck. I'm like, dude, no big deal. It's all good. Like, even though in my head, I'm like, it's not just a meth pipe this dude's got. Like, something's up. And so I, I it, it's funny, dude. I hear these squeaky ass brakes, dude. Every freaking PD car that we had, squeaky ass brakes all the time, dude. It used to drive me nuts because I'm trying to sneak up on people and it's just the whole, the whole <laughs> okay. way. So I knew it was a PD car. I just didn't know who, cause I'm, I didn't want to turn around. Cause I want to keep my eyes on this dude the whole time. So I just kind of like, like stay with me, whoever you are, I have no idea who you are, but just literally stay with me. 
So the car stops, cop gets out. Now cop standing right next to me. So I'm like, okay, there's someone else here. Now I have a little bit of a lull. I'm going to put this out on the radio. So I put it out. Hey, we call it an 1154. It's a, you know, just a stop, not a traffic stop, but I hopped out on a parked car. It's occupied by four or three. Mm-hmm. And um, dispatch is like, okay, cool. We got you. You know what I mean? We know where you're at. Everything's good. And uh, so I go back up. Little did I know there was two other um, cops and they were in different um, positions, but I'm just going to call them cops just so it doesn't give them away. Gotcha. Um, but two other cops doubled up in a car working a detail. We were having a ton of uh, robberies. Old Asian women were getting punched in the face, pistol whipped for just taking their, their, their purses, dude. So we had a little, within our own agency, had a, like a little task force built up for like a week and we were, we were going to go out and try to find these people. So they were working that unbeknownst to me. I didn't even know. And they hear me go on a stop. These are my good buddies. And they were like, hey, Nick's on a stop. Let's go see if he's all right, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so they come, as I'm talking, I'm still asking for these people's names. And So can I time you out for a second? Yeah. yeah. So there's, ultimately there's four police officers. There's two uniformed and two, maybe not uniformed or whatever, but there's four officers on scene right now. One that just came out of nowhere and right. you hand signaled over the other two that responded to your call. Mm-hmm. How long have you been there at this point? Honestly, I was probably there for three, four, okay. maybe five minutes. Okay. So at this time where I'm asking them what they're, well, you know, who are they, their names, mm-hmm. the other two cops hadn't got there. They were still driving there. Okay. So they're obviously lying to me about their names. Like they don't know their birthday. They don't know how to spell their last name. That's not normal. I'm like, okay, how do you spell that again? And it's totally different than what they just gave me. Um, so keep in mind, like this front right passenger continued this kind of like rocking and looking around and wiping his face with these gloves. And I'm like, dude, you need to relax, you know? And he's got this meth pipe, but he keeps kind of putting it underneath his, his thigh, trying to hide it. And I'm like, dude, stop. It's fine. Like, it's all good. If that's what you're worried about, you need to stop. At that time, the other two cops get there. They go around to the passenger side of the truck. So there's two on one side, two on the other. Yeah. Yeah. So I made the decision like, okay, enough. I'm not going to keep going down this road of what your name is. And um, so I pulled the driver out and I put his hands behind his back and I grab his hands. He's not in handcuffs yet. Put his hands in the small of his back. And I'm ultimately like, hey, dude, um, are you cool if I search you? Even though I had enough to arrest him, I just liked having that extra little piece of, yeah, you're totally fine searching me. Well, it also gives you more information depending on what right. his answer is to how he totally. responds, right? So yeah. And so I got his hands and I go to cant him, you know, to walk him back to my patrol car, which is right behind the truck. Cause I'm going to do a search of him, you know, on the hood where I did pretty much every search, um, you know, if it involved a car or whatever it was. And I take like, so now I'm, I'm moving away from my position, open driver's door. So I'm looking straight into the cab of the truck, bad guy sitting front, right passenger. And there's a female behind the back in the back seat. So now when, when I move away from the position I was at, I only took maybe four steps. So now the cop that was standing next to me kind of takes my mm-hmm. position. It's like the two man moving in. Right? right. So I'm, I'm focused now on walking this dude back. And this cop who took my position lets out Nick, his hands, his hands, his hands. I'm like, that's kind of weird. So I still a bad guy in his, in my hands. And I'd worked with this cop for a long time. Okay. So, and, and it just struck me as like, something's, something's up. You know, I never have heard that come out of their mouth. I was like, oh, like, so I, with bad guy still in my hand, I turn him and start walking back to where I was initially. Cause I can't let this dude go now. Cause I don't know what he has. And now he's going to be behind me. It's a bad situation. So I'm still holding on to dude. I walk back to where I was, but I'm now facing that open door. Bad guy's in the truck like this. So I kind of just, like, look in. Like what? Yeah, look in. Well, bad guy with the gloves, he's got a handgun just in his right hand laying on his right thigh. And he's literally, again, just staring at me. So he materialized this handgun while the other two or the three were up there. One's on the driver's side, two's on the other side. Uh, I assume coming from wherever under his leg where that meth pipe, where he, you thought he was just trying to stuff the thing, totally. but had suspicions yeah. it was something else. So he pulls the thing out. Guys are yelling hands. So yeah, they're yelling, Nick, his hands, his hands. Keep in mind that passenger side of the truck, dude, it was like spray paint um, tent. Like we're talking even up on, and the windows are up. The windows are up on passenger side. Yeah. So before I walked away, one of the cops opened the back door of the truck, 
said, Hey, I'm opening this so I can get a good, you know, so I can see, I can't see cause these windows. And so they're, both of them are kind of stacked on that, on that door, but I can see one of the cops is between that, that B pillar of the, mm-hmm. of the door. So, so between the front and the back window. Right. And he's definitely, you know, he's paying attention to that front right passenger, but dude, I'm like the, it was like, cause often like, seriously, I've seen spray painted windows, dude. Like they, cause more than likely they were living in this, okay. in this truck. Okay. Um, and so I don't know what transpired in that truck to when he presented the gun to his thigh at all. Cause I was walking back to the car. Um, and so I, I pop in and I'm looking at him and he's looking straight at me and he's got a gun just on his thigh. He's just looking at me. So I knew like I had this thought like, dude, he's got a gun. Your vest has nothing to your side. No side plate, no side plate, nothing. And I'm like, and you're turned side on because you have still have the hands of yeah. this other, other guy. So I'm behind the ball. I don't have my gun out. I just, it kind of uh, walked into this, you know what I mean? And I'm, I'm already behind the ball a little bit. So I'm pulling my gun out, yelling gun, gun, gun. So that my cops on the passenger side of the truck, I can't see, I can't see are like, boom. Okay. And they know who I'm talking about because they got eyes on the back they, passenger. Cause they got the door open. Yeah. So as I yell gun, 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 I'm, I'm pulling my gun out and I have it just coming out of my holster. It's not presented. presented. It's not doing nothing. I'm about here. And that's when bad guy decides to make his move essentially. And he goes, let's out like this roar. Yeah. And he like comes across the, the um, center console of the truck and points the gun straight at my face, like full looking down the barrel of it. At the time it makes it to about, you know, where it's pointed at me. I have my gun coming up, you know, so I'm still behind a little bit, but I'm, I'm going to get, I'm like, you know, squinting my eyes, I'm going to get a freaking round off because I'm behind that much. At the last second where I'm making this decision, like I have to shoot this dude before he shoots me. Mm. Like it, it, I have to do this or I'm dead. And I may even die anyways, because I'm that far behind. And I, at the time I didn't realize when I yell gun, 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 those two cops are blowing that door open. The, the bad guy sit the front seat door. Yeah. The front front, passenger front passenger door. So they, they're opening the door and now as soon as I kind of get my gun up a little bit, I see my buddies coming through that door and they're like hands on about to tackle this dude. Sounds familiar, dude. Yeah. So again, I was like, you know, I can chance this, but that's not me. I'm, I'm not going to take a chance. I'm, these, these guys are my family. I know their families. They got kids. Um, one of them does. And I'm like, dude, if I, if a round goes through bad guy and hits one of my cops, and kills him. I'm never going to be able to live with myself, dude. Like this is, I made that decision a long time ago too. When I first started where it's like, dude, that scared the shit out of me. Is that blue on blue? You don't know where your partners are and you're shooting that bad guy and you accidentally shoot your, your buddy. So I made the decision. I'm like, Nope, I'm not doing that. There's too, there's too many variables. And, and when we sit here and talk about it, it doesn't really, it, it doesn't, it was fast paced, dude. A lot of movement, super t- tight, tight quarters, you know, so there was not a lot of room for, there was no room for error, none. If one shot missed a little bit, we're done. Um, so my, my two buddies are coming through the door. I make the decision. No, I'm not going to shoot. My backdrop is terrible, obviously. And, uh, that's when bad guy pulls the trigger, um, shoots me 10 X just literally right here in the forehead. Over your right eye. Yeah. So I, you know, it, it takes me back a little bit. I take a couple steps. I let bad guy one from the driver's seat go. Wait, <laughs> get time out. So you take a, you, you get shot in the face Yeah, and yeah, it's going to set you back. I mean, you just got shot in the face. How far are you from the muzzle of this gun? Dude, me to you. Dude, this, this table is 36 inches across or like maybe 40 inches, I think. Yeah. That, that close. Yeah. Okay. So you take a couple steps back. Right. So <laughs> I, I tried to not fall. Cause I, I, I mean, I, I don't even think I tried to do really anything. This was just a complete reaction about just getting, you know, um, shot in the face. But the, then we go into this really weird, like self-evaluation thing that I, that I did that guy, one got let go. I have no idea where he is. I didn't hear a gunshot and I, and I got a little tunnel vision. My ears are ringing a little bit. Um, I remember my, my legs, dude, felt like I had 45 pound dumbbells strapped to them, dude. Like I could not, I'm like, I have my motor functions. I, I know what's going on, but I like, I, I know I've been shot 
but I don't understand why nothing's black. Like I, dude, how I just got, am I still here? How yeah. am I still here? I don't know. So I had this thought. It was, it's crazy, dude. I'm all this round. Literally. I have such, I have no brain cells. You know what I mean? Like I'm not smart. So my brain's probably this big and it rode the top of my skull and just exited. Which is not what well, actually, which happens. Right. 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 Per, in particular with smaller caliber weapons. Right. right? Yeah. So I, that's, that's what I thought. I was like, okay, I, I know I've been shot with something. I didn't hear it. I, I attributed it to like, you know, maybe I did hear it. I just, I'm not processing it right now. You know what I mean? But like my ears were ringing. So I'm like, maybe, maybe it was a, a, a shot came out and that's why my ears are ringing. Um, but I'm like, dude, I, I, I'm, I'm totally kind of normal. I'm like, what is going on? You know? So I'm now walking, not walking, but I'm facing towards my patrol car out of that open door. I just kind of pass the the back door of the, of the truck and the door blows open and this female comes running out. Like she like stumbles over me and I don't even pay attention to her. Cause I I'm like, dude, what is going on? And that's when I put my hand on the, on the bed of the truck, the bed rail, like mm. right past the cab. And I could feel it rocking. The, the, cause there's a wrestling match right. apparently happening. I would imagine, right? Exactly. Like as soon as that goes down, cause these guys were already coming in right. the other side. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I feel the truck rocking. I can hear some commotion going on and I'm doing this self-evaluation thing of like, dude, I know I've just been shot. I don't know how I'm not dead. Maybe I'm going to die. Maybe I have a couple seconds, but that rocking of that truck. And then the thought of, do my buddies are fighting over a gun right now? Dude, snap me out of all of that. I'm like, I got to get over there. So it was kind of like a go T deep breath. You got to move, dude. You can't think about what's going on with you. Deal with that shit later. And so I make myself around the, the truck to their side. And as I'm looking down the side of the truck, all I see is their, is their feet on the curb, and their entire body's on that front seat. And, and bad guy's a big dude. They're just in the truck. They're Everybody's on top of the seat, dude. Three dudes, three, I'm talking big. It's like a phone booth in there. Right. So I'm walking, I'm making my way towards the truck, but I kind of am walking kind of out so I can see into the truck right, what's going to on. to gain like some type of an angle. It was about at like halfway um, in the middle of the bed. That's about that distance to the, the front right passenger door. I see my buddy, one of the cops on that side, he's got the gun with his hands like this and the gun is over his head and you can see bad guy trying to point it down towards his head. And my buddy's moving his head, trying to keep his head away from- Side to side. Dude, it was- So he's framing up like in jujitsu and he's just moving right, his head. he's moving his head. Trying to avoid the muzzle of the gun. And I can see my other buddy, my other partner, trying to, trying to get shot placement, like trying to literally find a place to shoot bad guy to stop this. From Does he already have his, his weapon out? Yeah. Okay. His gun's out, but he's, he's having a difficult time because there's no room. There's no room. Right. You got, if this goes through and through, then right. my other guy's here. Like, and it's a fucking shit show. It is there. a- it is a full blown shit show. Wow. And so I had this, you know, another like do this formulate a plan, but you don't have time to formulate a plan. You got to just instantly come up with one. So my plan was, dude, I'm going to get to the back door. I'm going to get on top of that seat and I'm going to come up over the top of that front right passenger seat. And I'm going to have to shoot him from there. Yeah. Cause that's the down. only, that's the, the, in my mind, that was the only place that it would be safe to shoot because there's no, there's no room. There's no margin. So as I, as I get up there and I put my hand on that door handle, I hear a shot come out. So I go, oh shit, like, is that my buddy who just got shot in the head? Because I know bad guy shot me, mm -hmm. but I don't know who got shot at this point. And so I take like a fraction of a second before I get in and I'm looking, and that's when my buddy who had that gun pulls it out of dude's hand. So at that point I go, okay, I think, I think my, my partners Everybody's are good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think my partners are good. Um, but I definitely heard a shot. Maybe some, maybe they put one on him somewhere. Right. Right. So my, my partner who has the gun walks in front of the truck, right? I take his spot. We grab bad guy. We pull him out of the, the truck. I can now clearly see he has been shot once in, in kind of this area, like the, the center mass, the center mass, chest, yeah. chest cavity. Um, so we pull him out and we start rendering aid to him. And at the time we're pulling him out, my buddy who took the gun and he's like yelling, it's a fucking BB gun. Fuck. It's a fucking BB gun. Oh and my, then oh my God. I go, that's what this dude shot me with. <sighs> so I, I'm like, okay. I, and, and it was a sigh of relief at a certain, you know, at a certain point for me, because I was like, okay, it wasn't around. Like it wasn't, I know it didn't 
penetrate. You know what I mean? Like I knew I was somewhat good, but I could deal with it later now, you know, and I could feel, you know, a little, a little bit. I felt like a pinch when it first shot me, but I knew something was there, but now I could kind of take a little bit of a breath and go. Well, yeah. I mean, going back to the beginning stages of this, I mean, adrenaline starts going, right? So people can go minutes or whatever after being shot non-lethally or, or even lethally and keep going with the the adrenaline's moving. And so now things are starting to, to register, to register for sure. And so we work on dude for, uh, maybe a couple minutes before everybody's starting to show up. Um, I, I tried getting radio traffic out. Um, but I think I stepped on myself or I didn't keep the mic in the right way. So, um, my partner who actually ripped the gun, got it out on the radio that this had happened. So we had everybody coming towards us. Um, so they all arrived. They kind of took over, um, rendering this guy aid. We had an ambulance there, dude, within minutes. Like it, that was a good thing. You know what I mean? And, and we had actually two show up, um, within that same time frame. So they put bad guy in the ambulance and got him on his way to the hospital and started working on him in the, in the ambulance very quickly. Lieutenant arrives and he's kind of now directing traffic, right? He's like, Hey, you cop, you're with Nick, this cop's with you. So they're sequestering us, but on scene before we get kind of taken to where we're going next. And, um, we're standing on the same, we're standing on the same sidewalk where this went down just a little bit, um, North of, of where it actually happened. And, uh, we're now standing pretty far apart from each other and we have a designated cop with us. Um, and I'm just like, the first thing that came to my mind was, dude, my wife is going to fucking lose her mind. Mm-hmm. You know, like your worst nightmare. Just yeah. Happen. Like not, not that I was involved in a shooting, but the fact I, I got shot with something is something that she was going to fucking lose her mind on. I already knew, I knew that was going to have to be told to her from me. Right. Like I didn't want someone calling her and saying, Hey, Nick was involved in a shooting. You got shot, but it was just a BB gun because there's there, that would have left so many questions for her sure. that, um, I was like, but this is all I'm thinking in my head. I'm not talking out loud. I'm not saying nothing to anybody. And I'm kind of like, you know, that was close, dude. Like, damn, I don't know how, how that wasn't a real gun. Cause dude, the gun, it, it, there's pictures of it, but, um, it, dude, it looks identical. So to be clear, is this like a copper BB or is this like an airsoft gun? Copper BB is a a silver metal, metal BB. So the reason I ask is if you just jump on like the internet or whatever, and you start cruising around you look at these airsoft guns, you look at these BB guns, if you are first off in the amount of time that you had to identify that, what that was, whatever, they look as real as any, and they're real firearms. They're just not firing a projectile that's being powered by powder. Right. Um, Exactly. And dude, the thing said Glock on it, like Glock 17, like had all of the, it looked identical to my gun. There was your duty gun. Yeah. It Mm -hmm. was, there was nothing about it other than it was like even worn, you know, or it was like, it wasn't black in some places. It was worn in the same steel had been blue. Yeah. Almost in the same way. My older gun, before I switched to this, to the nine mil had from pulling it in and out of my, my holster so many times, like it, it had wear on it that you would think like was actually from like a, from a, a QLS system yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and when I saw the gun afterwards, it was sitting on the hood of my car and I, you know, cause remember there was two other people in that car and we had no idea where they were. So I'm like, dude, we have two other people that aren't accounted for. Well, they had this, thrown themselves out in the street. Oh, they didn't get very no, far. They were like, they we did it want, on their own. We don't want to have anything yeah. to do with this. Yeah. Um, so I'm running in between the truck and my car to try to f- see if I can see them running or doing something. And this was before we were sequestered and before people got there. Right. Um, and I remember looking at the gun and I'm like, holy shit. Like it was identical. Like, to are we sure this is a BB gun? Right. Yeah. And the only thing I, I recognized on it um, when it was sitting on the hood was there was electrical tape around the handle, like the actual handle. And there was something different about where the mag would go in. That's the only, and I didn't obviously see that when shit was going down, but as it was laying there, like, dude, it was spitting image. Like it, it was a real gun to me. Like it looked, and there's pictures on the internet of it, of the actual gun in an article or whatever it was. Um, and you could, I mean, you look at it, you take one look, you're like, holy shit, dude, that's insane. I don't know how to this day that it wasn't a real gun. I don't know whoever was looking out for me that day. Thank you. But I, I don't, I don't know what the percentage would be. Like I, I wrap my mind around that over and over again. 
Well, by the way, a BB gun could, could kill you. I mean, you could have got hidden in the eye yeah. and whatever else. I mean, there's, there's I'd actually, I had actually responded to a shooting where a juvenile had shot a lady through the eyeball, like blew her eye completely out. And she, I think lost the eye and it actually made its way almost to her brain, like literally almost penetrated went all, I mean, so I had like that, that immediately came back to me, but it wasn't, I wasn't concerned with that anymore. I was just trying to digest, you know, like, I can't believe that this dude one pulled the trigger on me with a fake gun and how it was fake. It's not fake though. I mean, right. that's what I'm trying to say. Well, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not nothing fake. fake about that gun. I mean, but it's not, you know, it's not a nine millimeter. Right. 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 Uh, so, all right. So you, you, you were just talking about how, like, I got to, how am I going to tell my wife this shit? Right. This is, this is, this is bad. And, um, and my wife, <laughs> I'd have to come home and tell her all the shit that I had been in for, it was about eight, it was about seven years. No, eight years, eight years. Like all of that shit accumulated. There'd been times where we would have discussions in the garage about the shit I'd just been through or, Hey dude, I'm getting sued again. Or, Hey, there's a video coming out. Like it's going to, you know, so there, you know, Hey, I got in pursuit and I had to fight this dude. I broke my hand um, a couple of years prior fighting some dude and, so she had been through kind of the ringer a little bit already. Mm. So, you know, that just, that thought in my brain was like, dude, she's going to, she's going to lose her mind. You're doing this on the curb or on the street, like minutes right, after right. all this. All right. So then what? So once, uh, cause the, the way I understand this is you have to be sequestering means you got to be isolated yeah. like um, nearly immediately. And so obviously in the field that happens in the way that you just said, Hey, this cop, this, you know, Here's where all you guys Separate. are going. Yeah. yeah. Go to your, your three corners yeah. or four corners at this point. And then, then what? So then, um, we were, we're attached to a cop, right. And they're like, Hey, we're going back to the station and they designated certain areas for us to be. Cause what, what my agency does, there's a hotel that's pretty close to our agency. So they set us up in the hotel Got in it. different rooms. Got it. Um, so you're not actually at the station in like some right. interrogation exactly. room or something. Exactly. Um, I think that's so smart. Yeah, dude, it, yeah. it makes it, but I, but I also had experience with this before. So I, I kind of knew what I was getting into a little bit because I'd been sequestered, been through, you know, that other critical incident where, okay. so I, I was not so much worried about that. I knew it was going to be a long, long night. Mm -hmm. Like, but what I did was it was probably two, three minutes afterwards. I went and got my dog. So I had my, Oh, he's still in the back of the car. Yeah. And I can see him because I had my windows down. And he's just staring at me, dude. Pointy ears. Okay. Can we, can we yeah. time out for a second then? I don't know. It, on the unit, did it have, do you have like a automatic door open to yeah. let the, did that ever cross your mind at any point? No, because that would, you know. <clears throat> that just escalates the situation. It right? would have been another variable. Somebody's getting bit and it might not be the right, right person. Yeah. Way too close quarters, way too fast happening. And I didn't, I didn't have enough time to even. Get there. Hit the door pop, get the dog. Now I got the dog to worry about instead of potentially helping my buddies on the other side. So I, I, I never even crossed okay. my mind. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you go get the dog. Yeah. So I get the dog and he had been, he's been with me since that minute to right now with you. You know what I mean? And, and I've leaned on him super hard, dude. Like, these dogs are, I mean, it goes without saying amazing. You know, he, uh, he gave up his career too, to help me, you know, cause he's turned into kind of a, quasi service dog for me, you know, sure. like I, nothing really seemed to help me and we'll get into that. I'm kind of chomping ahead, but you know, he helped me a lot after that. So they allow you to take the dog back to the hotel. So, so we go back to the station. I made the decision not to take him to the hotel. Okay. So we had a, a kennel at the, at mm -hmm. the station. Um, and funny enough, that initial canine handler that I talked to when I was a brand new cop about, oh, canines, right. he comes and he takes care of my dog while I'm being sequestered. Wow. So like full circle, full circle shit. Yeah, dude. And just a phenomenal dude. Like he'd been there all night. He was checking on us, getting us shit that we needed. So, I mean, just, just class act when it came to that. Um, so we get back to the station. They, they, you know, put us in these locations. And I, I was um, set up with this cop who knew my whole family, worked for my uncle. Big surprise, super, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, super close with my cousin. I was super close with him. And he had been in this same position with another cop who had been through a pretty gnarly um, officer involved shooting. So he was the best dude. I get in the car, I put my dog in the back seat and he was driving a car where there was only one bad guy seat. 
So Tyke's in the back, like slipping and sliding. He has nowhere to go. So he's like super contained. He was kind of flipping out a little bit because he's on a plastic seat instead of a flat. Right. Gotcha. You know? Yeah. Um, and this cop, he looks at me and he, and he can tell I'm kind of like, dude, holy shit. He's like, Hey man, uh, if you hurry up back. We can catch the giants game. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, so, then haul ass back. Right. Let's go. So it's interesting. I mean, I hear this a lot. I think this happens a lot of times in life again, outside of law enforcement too, that we handle these situations with humor yeah. and it seems to kind of downregulate at the time. But at the re reality is, I mean, what are we doing there? We're just putting more stuff in the backpack, right? right? We're totally. trying to get it into the backpack, yeah. but uh, something tells me this isn't going to, this one's not going into the backpack. No, no backpack is like, oh, it's over full. It's, it's like tethering at the bottom right now. Mm -hmm. Like it's about to just full boom. Everything's coming out. Um, get back to the station. At this point, I hadn't told anybody that dude shot me in the face because I'm not, I, I, I knew I couldn't talk. So I was like having this struggle where it's like, I can't tell him shit. Obviously I have this fuck this, yeah. you know, well on my forehead. Mm -hmm. So I'm waiting. I'm like, I, I'm like trying to get this out. Like, I'm like, dude, someone come talk to me so I can tell them because in my thought was, dude, I need them to search that area, try to find this BB. You know what I mean? Like I, I, whether there was evidence stuff that needed to be done, like I just needed people to know. Um, so that same cop who's taking care of my dog, he comes and sees me. Um, and I tell him they're just white as a ghost, like straight up, like, are you kidding me? Is that what that is? Oh yeah. And he literally was like, just turn around and walked out. Cause he was like this, like just he went could, straight. Yeah. I can't Couldn't even it. communicate with like, didn't, asked me any other questions, just went, copy that, turned and walked out and went and told people that needed to know. Um, so short time after, probably been about, I don't know, 30 minutes, 30 minutes to an hour. Um, we go to the hotel and we're up on the hotel for hours. Um, talk to attorneys, take photographs, full 360 photographs, um, photographing our, our, you know, guns, everything we have on our belt. Um, but the, the way it happened I think there was another officer involved shooting in a different agency within our county. So they didn't have investigators to meet to with cover us. cover all of it. Right. So it was probably midnight. I think the shooting went down like an hour after I got to work. It was right off the, the, the jump. Um, so I got off, I think around midnight and went home and didn't do my interviews till like a day later, the next day. Or, wow. or yeah, next day. Um, so, you know, I, I can't tell my wife what just, all this shit just locked in there. Right. Like, dude. And it's like, fuck, like I, I obviously had, my wife was notified, but I made it very clear. Like there can't even be any kind of, you know, indicators that this happened to me specifically. Um, so go home. She knows I've been involved in a shooting. She knows I haven't been through the interview process yet. So she's got a ton of questions. She's trying, you know, she's just trying to be like, Hey dude, just go to sleep. We'll figure this shit out tomorrow. Just, just go relax. You know, luckily my kids were asleep at that uh, time. You know, relax, just relax. You're right. And, and so I wake up in the morning, um, good buddy of mine who I work with, um, who's been through a couple critical incidents, picks me up, drives me to uh, my interview. Um, and you know, we do that whole interview process and, and it, that one was much tougher than the previous critical incident I was involved in. You know, this was much more detailed, much more dangerous to me. You know what I mean? So it was, a, it was a tough interview to get through, um, got through it. And then the shit show commenced, dude, media protests, like just a whirlwind uh, of shit. So we didn't talk about what happened to this guy who shot you. Did he mm. ultimately not make it? Yeah. He passed away at the, um, at the hospital. Okay. So yeah, obviously shooting is one thing shooting and having a deceased suspect is another. So, right. And yeah. So the media gets a hold of this and, and it's as, 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 uh, most people in media will do, they don't know what to do themselves except for wet themselves and then say and do whatever they need to do in order to get the story out there and get some right. attention. And, and, you know, it actually, it actually took like a week for this to kind of, for, kind of get for, out there for this whole media frenzy kind of thing afterwards to even take place. So yeah. it was, it was a weird 
thing for me because I thought it was going to happen right off the right off the jump. You know, as soon as they heard that there was an officer involved shooting, I knew it was just going to be boom. And as soon as they got you know info that bad guy passed away, it was going to blow up, right? Yeah. So, but it didn't. Um, Is that because it maybe just kept it was kept quiet by the department and the people that were involved? You know, I, I honestly I mean because there's so many people. I mean, obviously this went through an name, you know, some medics showed up and then they went right. to the hospital and there's nurses and doctors and staff and all that involved. Somebody's talking. I, I, I honestly, I have no idea. Oh, I think maybe that other officer involved shooting that occurred, maybe, maybe took, took distracted. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they found out about it afterwards, but once they found out it was off to the races, you know, this, you know, cop shoot and kill somebody over changing a tire. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that was the, that was the story. Uh, that literally is they they uh, that uh, for months it was you know he look at this guy he got shot because you know he had a flat tire and, and he was changing his tire and they just came up and shot him yeah. you know what I mean so it, like the whole months following was just uh it, it was tough dude you know because you are you you're obviously not going to call up the media and be like dude this is what happened you you, you can't there's a full right. investigation going on you can't say anything really and um it was tough, dude. There was Instagrams that, that got made with our faces on it, calling us murderers. And, and you know, it, it was just tough seeing yourself in that. Cause you're like, all of a sudden now you're a criminal. Yeah. Now I'm now, now I'm a criminal. Like, dude, you guys have no idea what happened, but you just go straight there. So, you know, it was, it was a long road in that aspect on its own. So as you got through and you've kind of gone through this, um, this, you're going through the investigation, you've been sequestered, you kind of got through there, they take the report. And then, you know, I imagine there's a couple of things like that would be protocol. First off, all right, man, you're going to take seven days behind a desk or something, like whatever that is. And then, right. you know, we're going to require you to go through, you know, five counseling sessions for 30 minutes each or something. There's right. some, something right. like there. What is that like? Like, so, what, how, how does that look? How's that built? So it's, um, you get a week off, you know, to decompress and then, um, they do a, like a debrief counseling session. Um, they started off with just the people involved. You meet with a counselor for, I don't know, I think it was an hour. Mm -hmm. And then they open it up for the rest of the police department to come in and go through a counseling session with everybody. And I was surprised a lot of people showed up, you know what I mean? Um, and they wanted one to make sure we were good. They wanted to make sure they wanted to know what happened. You know what I mean? Like, dude, let's hear from you guys. Let's hear from you guys. Yeah. So we went, you know, back down the whole thing, just like so I told you. Have to you, relive it. Relived it, and you know, man, I, I'm I'm thankful I worked with the people I work with. Mm. You know, they were just the best. You know, you ever heard this before? It takes a village, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah, nobody's doing sure. this shit on their own. Yeah, you know, and and then my agency was super good with you know the your buddies on the street reaching out, but they were super cool with hey you know, don't feel the need to call me back. I just want to let you know, I'm thinking about you. And if you need anything, then hit me up. You know, it was really it's not pressure. Yeah. yeah it's not no like, pressure. Hey, I'm curious. I want to satisfy my own curiosity exactly. and talking to you and see exactly. how you're really doing. Yeah. yeah. So that, that was, um, I was happy about that. Cause I, I would, I, I don't want to talk to anybody at this point about right. anything really. Yeah. Cause if you're making that phone call, who am I doing it for? Am I doing this for me to make exactly. myself feel better? Exactly. Or I'm doing this to feel Nick, make Nick yeah. feel better. Or it is, is it both? Cause if it's, if it's not taking care of Nick, then it's not important right now. Right. And it, you know, the same thing with my canine group, you know what I mean? Oh yeah. They were, tight knit family. Dude, right? they were awesome. I mean, all of them reaching out, doing the same thing. Hey dude, like we can't wait until you get back to training, but you know, take your time. A couple canine handlers been through, you know, a ton of stuff and they were like, if you ever need to talk, like hit me up, dude. Mm -hmm. You know? So it was a lot of support. So are you talking? But you just said like, I don't want to talk to anybody. It was mainly like, Hey dude, I'll, I'll hit you up in a couple of days. You know what I mean? Um, what was your real intention with that? Put it, <laughs> put it in the backpack and move on, get back to work. Honestly. Yeah. Yeah. When did the reality of that set in? Um, I'd say five days after. Was there like a moment? I mean, did you have to be told? I mean, what happened when the backpack rips? So, so after that week that we were off, I come back to work <laughs> okay. on a Wednesday. Like, dude, mm -hmm. it was the same day. It was a week from that day. Right. So I'm driving back in Wild. and I'm kissing my wife. I'm saying bye to my kids. The Here same way I did right back to the routine. Right? Yeah. That's when it did. 
when I got back into uniform a week later, I got back in my car and I'm like, dude, I can't, this is no, I'm not ready. Luckily. And it's crazy how things work out. Luckily, um, my Lieutenant comes up to me and this dude, this Lieutenant and me, he's like a dad figure to me, dude. I, this guy, I got all the love in the world for, um, comes up to me, grabs me and goes, Hey, um, we're actually putting you guys on administrative leave. Um, indefinitely for now, because at this time, media started blowing up. This was like maybe okay. the second day after the media caught wind of this. And he's like, we don't want you guys out on the street. Yeah. It's not a good spot. Yeah. Right, right. Um, so we're putting you on admin leave. Um, and we'll just let you know when this is done. Like we're not even putting a time cap on it, dude. You're just, you're off. That's wild that it, you got all the way back to work before you were dude, told I was, this. I was in uniform, had the dog, put the dog in the car. I sat in my car. Is this just one of those things where the fucking Lieutenant like, is like, why are these guys even here? Like, how did this even happen? And he's rushing out to go, Hey guys, right. like, sorry, you're having to hear this from me right now while right. you're ready to roll back into patrol. But get the fuck out of here. Like you shouldn't be here right now. And like, yeah. he's, putting it, he's serving it up to you in a nice little package here. Right. But the reality of it is, is was he caught off guard by you guys even being back to work? Or is, I mean, do you even know the answer to that? I mean, I, I don't know the, diff, you know, the actual answer to that, but I had always gotten to work super early. Um, okay. Because the dog, like I, I'd always set it up. Normally I'd be driving a patrol car in. So I'd already had my car, my uniform, my dog set but up. But you left that behind. Right. Yeah. So I had to get there a little early. Um, I think the decision was made that morning. Um, and the discussion was going on over the course of right the next up couple to the hours. last minute. Right. Yeah. Um, because I think the police department, the city, everyone was caught off guard with how much attention this got and how big it kind of got. And this was only like, you know, this was okay. a day after the media got it. Um, so they're triaging they're trying to yeah, figure dude. it out. And okay. So and it was yeah. before briefing, you know what I mean? So he, he was like, Hey dude, I'm sorry you drove in here. You know, I didn't expect you to show up two hours early, but we were just about to call you whether that was, I don't, I don't know, but I think it doesn't matter. It yeah. But they're, they're trying to handle shit right. as fast as it's coming in. But that was the biggest relief I had felt mm. where I was like, I can't believe I got to do this, dude. Like, I'm like, I don't know if I can do this. Cause I, my, my, on my way to work is when that backpack was just boom, rocks are coming out, dude. Like it was like, I, I was going over the, 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 you know, the bridge the same way I did that day. And I'm like, dude, I can't, there's no, there's, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but it's that mentality of dude, like, you know, you need to buck up or get, it, get, it, get yeah. it together. Yeah. And I had pushed past a couple of incidents before. That, yeah. Before. So I'm like, dude, this is going to be a struggle bus for a minute, but just, you know, ride it to your next stop and you're going to be fine. Jeez. And it just wasn't the case. So, all right. So what do you do? You go back inside, take the uniform off. Yeah. Uh, and head home, mm -hmm. head home with an unknown in front of, you now. with a, with an, with a huge unknown. And I'm sitting, I'm, I'm, I remember I got home and, and I'm telling my wife, I'm like, I'm on admin leave indefinitely for now. Did she know like kind of work? Well, at this point, yeah. did she know like you had no business being back at work? Yeah. You know, like totally, but without saying so. Yeah. She, she had, uh, we had a conversation. She's like, are you sure you're good? I'm fine. I'm fine. Exactly. Like just I, like that. I hate that word. Yeah. And, and I think she was super concerned, but she was like, I, you know, he's done this before. This is just his way of, of maybe dealing with stuff and, and he'll be fine. But I could tell it was different in her. She was very concerned, you know? So you, you recognize going into work that day that you weren't fine. You get home. Now you're telling your wife, like, I'm not fine. Yeah. Here's what's going on when you start, when you start to purge the valve a little bit there, how does that, how does that work? Does it all come out at once? Um, yeah. It vomit, dude. It was just straight out in the open now. And I had had conversations with my wife over the course of my career that, Hey, this is kind of bugging me. Can we just talk about it for a minute? Like, let me, let me hear what you think, mm -hmm. you know? And oftentimes in her, you know, she would think like, geez, like this is nuts, but she wouldn't, say that mm -hmm. she'd be like, well, you know, and she'd give me kind of constructive criticism or, or, or constructive kind of game plan as to help myself. But I, dude, I didn't listen. I, I was just like, all right, at least I got it out. Maybe it'll help me. I just never bought into, Hey, you need to talk. You need your to talk. Wife's, your wife's not a counselor. She's your wife. Right. 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 So that's, it's almost like it's appropriate to share and what's she going to do with that information, except for right. try to be supportive. Yeah. That's a really tough position to be on the other end of. On top of her, 
being a dispatcher. So she, yeah. You know what I mean? She's got her own stuff. And she's, she's in and out of work. She got her own backpack, by the way. Dude, totally. Yeah. Totally. And, you know, I had tried to help her with, you know, her stuff. And then I didn't want to come across as like, I'm putting all my shit on you, even though you got your own stuff that you've been through that you're dealing with. And, and I'm like, I got to be tougher. You know, I, I always had that conversation with myself. Yeah. Like, dude, don't sink to that. You're tough, dude. Keep, you suck know, it up. yeah, suck it up. All right. So, um, you kind of unload a little bit. Um, what's going on in your own head at this point? Now you've got this, this, um, you're starting to unload a little bit. Wife's a little bit more aware now right. of what's going on. Um, you have some resources that have been made avail- available to you. There's the counselor, there's your buddies that you could go to and have a conversation yeah. with. Um, but you're not really doing that mm-hmm. because that's not what tough guys do. Right. Right. So what happens? Like, are you, do you realize like I need to talk to a professional here or is it do more things have to happen before you make the decision? Like my wife's not my therapist or my counselor right. or psychiatrist, psych- yeah. psychologist. I've got to go outside. What, can you walk us through that? It was a, it was actually a couple different things, you know, like I had started drinking like crazy, dude. And that was a huge problem. Um, those two things don't mix well, you know? Um, and I'm talking like five days straight, like just, just trying to numb it all. Yeah, man. You know, and I, and I, you know, I reached out to a friend of mine who I worked with on the street. He's a um, special forces guy ton of experience. One of the best human beings I think I've ever met in my life, dude. Just a solid dude. And I remember it was probably one o'clock in the morning. I'm in the garage. I'm, I'm hammered by myself. Um, and I'm, and I'm, I can feel something like it's up. Something's up. Like I'm not right. You know, and I'm, I'm just angry, dude, just super angry. Um, wasn't as bad as it got a couple months later, you know, but I called him. Like, hey, dude, I just need to vent this. Like, what do you think? And it was his day off, dude. Dude stayed on the phone with me until four o'clock in the morning mm-hmm. and put a lot of things in perspective for me, you know? Um, and he's like, you know, you gotta, you gotta get somebody that you can talk to, dude. Like, it'd be a good thing for you. If, it, if you do it and it works, great. If you do it and it doesn't work, then you go find someone else. Then, then you'll know. Yeah. Then you'll know. And you, you keep going down that path of trying to make yourself better. Don't just hit the booze and, and say, Hey, this will go away soon. Cause it ain't. And he's flat out said that to me. This ain't going away, dude. Yeah, it will be right back in the same spot yeah. tomorrow at one in the morning. Yeah. And he, you know, he had been with me through some, some Other good stuff, stuff on the street. You know what I mean? So he knew the type of person I, I am. He knew what kind of cop I was. Um, so did you heed that advice? Yeah. Yeah. And funny enough, I actually, one of my buddies I went to the Academy with whom, one of my best friends, he had been working at an agency up North when those real bad fires came out Mm -hmm. and he had talked to somebody super cool psychologist, um, retired cop talking like paradise fire and stuff like that. Um, not paradise, the Lake County fires. Yeah, Lake County. Um, and he had, he was talking to the psychologist and months before the shooting I had called, I I called him. We were talking about other stuff and I'm like, Hey dude, like who's that psychologist you were talking to? Mm -hmm. I didn't go into detail with what, I thought was kind of going cause it wasn't all that much, you know, he gave me the name, the number and everything. I did nothing with it. Um, but then I remembered like, Oh shit, I actually asked him mm-hmm. who's a good psychologist or whatever. And next morning dialed it up. Dude was super cool on the phone. He's like, absolutely. I will help you. Like, let's get something scheduled. Let's get you on a, on a, on a regular treatment program. Mm-hmm. Um, cause I obviously told him what had happened and a little bit about my career. And, uh, dude, I've been seeing him for 19 months. He's just, dude, one of the best dudes. So it's a long time. So I'm sure there's a ton of discovery that has to happen in this process from obviously the person that you're working with, but with you getting stuff right. out, you tend to finally, I've been through this process, not like in the same circumstance, but you start to understand, you start to kind of reflect back and go, fuck, look at all these red flags that I just straight up ignored. Totally. Or, you know, pretended that they weren't there when they were really, when they were, were there the whole time. And, and that presents its own set of problems. Yeah. Like, man, I'm, I'm a fucking failure. Like this could have been avoided or I could have been, yeah. I could have been such a better person here. I could have done this so much better here if I had just not been a hard headed 
I'm fine, you know, type of dude and move through. And that yeah. can be, that can be a lot of, um, that can be a lot, that can be very stressful and that can weigh even heavier or more heavy on the situation and almost exacerbate it. Sometimes it has to get worse before it gets better. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you said 19 months. I mean, that's a long time as you're going through this process of, of, um, figuring it out and, and sort of unloading when, when, if at whatever point did the agency reach back out and say, all right, man, like, we'd like to have you come back to work now. Did this happen? Like what, how did, what happened? So we did six months on, um, admin leave. All of you. Yeah. So because media was so bad, I think the city got a ton of pressure, um, from some outside people and organizations that they actually took the case and put it out to an independent, um, Oh shit. Yeah. They want you guys to fry. So they want the agency to fry. They want you guys to fry. So instead of having, cause normally what happens, uh, an agency within your County does the investigation, mm -hmm. right? And then you do your own internal investigation. Mm -hmm. Now they wanted a third independent investigation to go on and they wanted to send it to, you know, someone else. I mean, it was like, it, it just overload, you know? So we had to actually do another interview with this independent company that was, was investigating it. Um, so that took some time. What I had done is I started talking to my psychologist about a week and a half, two weeks after the shooting and put in a worker or workers comp claim for it right then and there. So I wasn't on like leave, they call it 48, 50 time. That's yeah. the, when you're injured, you're out on injury. Okay. So I wasn't on that. I was on administrative leave, but I already had had, you were set up. I was set up. Mm -hmm. So the agency in the city already knew that was coming. So when the six month time was up and it was like, Hey, come back to work. They had already, they already knew I wasn't. So they already knew, okay, now he's on 48, 50 for however okay. long he needs. Okay. Um, so that transitioned in, into admin leave straight to 48, 50. And that's ultimately what I was on until I retired. Got you. So man, I can imagine that presents some issues, right. Uh, from a department perspective and we'll wait a minute. Like we protected this guy. We fought back. We went through these investigations. We went through all the rings and hoops. Um, and now he's not coming back to work. What is the deal? Were you getting pressure? What are you, were you being supported? What was happening? Um, <clears throat> no pressure. There wasn't any pressure. Um, I think honestly, they thought, Hey, let him get good. You know what I mean? Cause this was a big thing. No pressure at that point. There was support. Um, for sure. But I think their thought was like, he's going to come back at some point. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, um, I had heard some things, you know, some eh, through a couple different people of some people kind of saying some things that I, I, I didn't like, you know, Hey, he's just riding this for some time off or, you know, he's you're trying to get a retirement for the money. I'm like what fucking money are you talking about? You know what I mean? There's no money in You'd this. You'd only done seven years or whatever. Yeah, I'm like, I'm, I'm like, no one ever gets into law enforcement for money, dude. We get we get paid real well. We have a good retirement, good medical insurance. If you live long enough to collect it all. Right, right. And, and so uh, there was those kind of, uh, you know, things that I heard. But I didn't really fester on them as much as... I thought I was going to, because I one thought, Hey, I didn't hear it from this actual person. So, yeah. you know, a cop perspective, yeah. Dude, cops talk shit about everything and everyone. I did it. You know what I mean? It's just like, it's kind of the culture. It's like, Hey, um, so I didn't really take it seriously, um, at that point, you know, but they were, they were supportive, man. And that initial finding out, Hey, he's on leave for this. It was like, okay, like you sit and you get right. That's it. So at what point then do you make the decision like I'm done or I can't go back or does somebody make that decision for you? Um, my psychologist made that decision for me. He, you know, it was about almost a year, almost a year is December of, of 21 actually. So not actually a year, but through the treatment program we were going on, you know, he had a conversation with me and he was like, you know, um, in my opinion, he was uh, prepping you for yeah. this, this, you, you can't add another one, dude. Like you're, you're out of nine lives one. And you know, I don't think this is good for you anymore because you, you, you go through something else. I don't know how bad this is going to get, you know? And, Fair enough. and 
basically what he told me in a nice way was you're going to deal with this for the rest of your life. This is something that's going to sit with you. It's the new normal. It's the new normal, man. And we got to kind of figure out your trajectory that will, will give you happiness and give you less stress. And, and so thank God he made that for me. But at the same time, me not making the decision sent me down a whole nother rabbit hole of kind of spiral, dude, you know, cause I was, I was angry. I was probably, I was more angry than I have ever been. So when you say you made the, dis- the decision for you, this is just like his recommendation to you, but what was also the recommendation to the department, yeah. um, to the agency at this, at the same time. Right. So yeah, you don't have control over this. And once that stamp goes in the file, like there's no turning back, right? Like, there's no turning back. So it's so, called, it's called permanent and stationary. So once you reach a permanent and stationary, uh, you're done, but there's a battle to go on because it's all with workers comp. Luckily with me, you hear these war stories about cops trying to retire and it takes them years and years and years to retire because the city is just fighting. They're like, no way. You know what I mean? Like we're going to still working. Cause yeah. think about, think about I'm 31 years old, man. A retirement, a medical retirement for me is a very expensive. That's expensive. Thing. Yeah. There's no return on that investment right. now. Right. Yeah. Right. So luckily my city never fought me, but what they, what they did as does every you know city, I think they just listened to the workers comp insurance company. And, yeah, that's and they, who they hired to deal and with. I, it, and yeah. my biggest enemy on this planet now is, is, is workers comp. You're just another number. Um, dude, it was the worst experience. Uh, I mean, coupled up against the, the getting shot in the face thing, this was right up there. Like it was like, dude, if you didn't have PTS already. You were going to have it a hundred percent. A hundred percent. They didn't give a shit that you had PTS. They, they literally, it felt like, Hey, you know, Johnny from some agency stubbed his toe and you need to wait until we get him figured out first, like zero sense of urgency. Um, and you'd put in these claims where it's like, my psychologist is, a, is someone who's a part of uh, the West coast trauma retreat, um, for first responders and for their families. It's a great retreat, five days in Northern California. And it, I, I've heard, I haven't been to it yet, but I've heard it just changes you. It helps you tremendously. It's one of the best things you can do, if not the best thing for first responders. And in December, or maybe a month prior to December, I don't, I'm not sure, but that same time frame, time frame, he had put in a request like, hey, this he needs to go to this retreat. Our workers' comp insurance company denies it, comes back with, and the reason for the denial was we don't recognize the word retreat as a medical term for PTSD. What it need to be, it needed to be like a check-in or a, like, like an admission, like it needs to be admitted to this program. I I honestly, even the, even my psychologist who's been doing this for 35 years had never heard of that because he, he came back with, he's like, well, it's really not a, it's not called really a retreat. We call it a retreat. So that when we tell the cop or the fireman or the paramedic who's going there, it's not like some huge medical work. Yeah. Yeah. It's not an inpatient. Exactly. And they still were like, no, no. All right. So, so you're not even dealing with the department anymore at this Mm-mm. point, you're getting support, right? To, but now you're trying to go through this process, which is handled being handled by a third party. Right. Um, and you're on your own. Yeah. Nobody's doing this for you. Like, right. so you get in, you go through the process of getting into the department, all the things that you've talked about over the years, all the things about changing your, the things that you were doing within the department becoming a canine officer, fighting for your, you know, or not, I guess just working so hard to do all the right things, to be in the right positions, to do the right things. You've got a, a couple incidents. This is this one is this ends up being a career ender. Right. Yeah. And now you're left all by yourself to deal with the rest of your life from a retirement perspective, right. because it's not as if when you get a stamp like that, I would assume like, it's not like, okay, well this department I've retired from this part but I could go work for somebody yeah, no. else. That's not what this is. No. This is not, you could go do this somewhere else. Right. No. Right. This is at 31 years old. I now have to be thinking about, I signed up to be a, a career law enforcement right. officer. I, I got no education. I got no other, nothing. I got a bag full of shit and a fight in front of me to get just a retirement, but I can never be a cop again. So aside from the red tape, like, I guess not aside from it, but what else is involved in that red tape? Like, okay, the dude's done. So the longer he's on this particular program, the more expensive it's going to get anyway. It's right. costing you, the insurance company, labor to even deal with it. What else is holding this shit up? Like if the, if the department's gone, we're good. 
right. pay this dude. So the department at this time, I don't even think they had any kind of understanding at all about what was going on. The communication between workers comp and the city is very minimal. It's like, Hey, what's going on? Oh, well, he's not permanent stationary. That's it. That's the only communication really that they're having okay. at this point. Once my psychologist put me permanent stationary, that went to workers comp. The box comp, gets checked right? and it gets, yeah. Well, now what workers comp does, they go, well, you're his psychologist. Now we're going to send him to ours. They start the whole process over again. Yeah. So now I wait three months for what's called a QME, um, qualified medical evaluation by basically they say as a doctor, that doesn't work f for them. It's not their doctor. Oh, everybody's pockets are getting well, mine, well, dude. Yeah. Dude, who does he get paid yeah, from? Come on. Them. Yeah, so, stupid. you know, anyway, so I, I get that scheduled and dude, I go to a QME guy in uh, Santa Rosa, Northern California. His, his, you know, practice or his office, whatever it is, is right next door to a police department, Santa Rosa police department. So I'm, I'm sitting in here, right? I've been, I've been seeing my psychologist for a year now, almost actually it was almost a, exactly a year. Now I got to go see this guy. I have no idea. It's an eight hour evaluation. I haven't even been to my police department yet. I'm, I have never, I hadn't gone back. Not since Lieutenant sent you home. So now I'm sitting here talking to someone I don't know who made it very clear in the beginning and his characteristic, you know, or his, how he was talking to me, he had his own opinion on law enforcement and it wasn't the same as mine. So I'm, I don't know that for sure, but I'm sensing it, you know? And I'm like, you know, this guy, I th honestly doesn't like cops. He, he, he's got his own personal, you know, um, yeah, he has opinion. no problem taking, yeah, he has no problem taking the paychecks that he's getting exactly. evaluating these people. Yeah. And then on top of that, I'm dealing with cars going code three out of the parking lot of the St. Rosa police department while I'm trying to get evaluated with my own shit. And I'm like turning my head. I'm like kind of, you know, not necessarily because I'm so freaked of the police cars, but I'm, it was a little bit of that, but it was also like, dude, what are they, are they something happening behind me? Is, is something happening here? I had a lot of anxiety, um, in that moment. That's super you know? legit. Dude. So we go through this eight hour thing. He, tells me at the end of it, he agrees that I shouldn't be a cop anymore, but doesn't think I'm permanent stationary because I haven't been to the retreat <laughs> that they've Stop denied, it. bro. Swear to God. Stop it. And that I haven't tried medication. Okay. So, so with this, I'm, I'm okay. This just got, yeah, this just got different. Yeah. So this is, this is why I'm so motivated to do some other things that we'll talk about in, in a little bit. But so this guy says this to me, but ultimately he says, like, I don't think you should be a cop again. Like, I agree with that. I go, okay, well, oh, that's fine. Cool. Like, I, I don't know what even this means, to be honest with you. I, I the details of what this report, yeah, what does, do we do next? Yeah. I, I didn't really know. So I told him, Hey, they denied my retreat a couple months ago. He's like, well, okay, well, I'm going to put in that they need to pay for it and they need to send you. And he asked me, he goes, so what's your thoughts on medication? And I go, well, my personal opinion on medication is I'm not taking it because I had done my own research and had my, a conversation with my psychologist about it. And in the very, in the very beginning, my, my psychologist goes, look, I, do I think medication could help? Sure. I think it could, but it may not. And so he's like, why don't you do a little research on your own? And then next week when we meet, we'll have another discussion about it. Cool. Well, I did research on it and all the side effects you know, the, the, um, suicidal thoughts, homicidal ideations, all, all of that part of it. I flat out was like, no, I'm lucky enough to have PTSD and have, and deal with everything I'm dealing with and not have that. I, I get shot in the face and it's a BB gun instead of a real gun. Why am I going to take my chances on some, you know, chemical I'm going to put in my body that's going to numb me and then potentially make it to where I do have these thoughts. No, it's not happening. So I told him that and he's like, okay, well, it takes 30 days to write a report. Keep in mind this psychologist that's for workers comp doesn't even own a computer. So he's dictating over the phone to some company about this uh, final report that he's doing. So you're waiting for 30 days just to move. The needle or, forward or just one to, notch. Yeah. Just to know what he says or <sighs> where the next, where the next, you know, where you go next. So we get the report. I read at the bottom of this report, not permanent stationary. I already knew that. 
because medication and the, and the retreat thing. And he goes underneath it. He can't return to his um, pre-injury employment, which is like, okay. Well, we knew that. We knew that. Underneath it, it goes, but I do think he can go be a cop in six to 12 months. This was never disclosed to you. In the- Dude, he's- it, it, He said straight up. So he straight you, lied to my I don't, face. Yeah. Yeah. You can't be a cop again. Right. So he, this is that report. The, the, the actual report, my psychologist tells me, he's like, dude, the, the substance of this report, you, you can't even come to that conclusion after it's, reading. It contradicts itself, right? 100%. Yeah. So then I go it's to- It's like my, you got the, like, you, were, did these reports get crossed right. out? Yeah. Right. So I now hired an attorney. This is the point where I get an attorney. Jesus. So the attorney is like, all right, we need to get, some clarifying questions back to this guy because this makes no sense, right? So we wait another month to get a response from this dude. What's his response? Yes, yeah, six to 12 months with medication. With medication. Now, so it changes. Right, so with we medication and tr- retreat. He, he, did, he did say retreat, but he worded it in a way of like just furthering treatment, but with that retreat and medication. So right, right after the initial report came out, my psychologist puts in another request for the retreat after their doctor said it. Right. Denied again, but okayed on the medication through the insurance company. Oh, that's a big fucking surprise. Really? So I'm like, okay, this, this is getting to the point where it's feeling like they're holding my retirement over my head and trying to force me to take these medications. That's what it feels like to me. I, I'm sitting on the other side of the table, dude. And right. I don't feel that. Like I'm looking at it goes, this is like, it's this is insane. two plus two equals right. four to me, but exactly. So you get better play ball or you're not getting what you want. It's exactly what it is. And so I was like, okay, well, no, I'm, I don't, I, I yeah, really fuck don't care. You, no. Fuck you. Fuck you. No. And so two, three months of battling, I'm, I'm talking back and forth. With it the was attorney. Just, yeah. Yeah. The attorney. And, and I had some back and forth with this attorney that we just didn't see eye to eye on certain things. And, you know, I, ha- I had to take a step back and realize, Hey, she's probably got a hundred people on her plate right now who are dealing with the same stuff I am. So I'm not going to take this out on her, even though personally, some things just didn't mesh very well, but ended up being okay. You know? And so right after, I think I, I had a phone call with you. It might've been the day before. Um, I called the city. I called human resources of the city. And I talked to somebody that who I knew, you know, I I didn't have a personal relationship with her, but I knew who she was. She knew who I was. And I just asked her like, look, what what is going on with this? And at this time, my psychologist wrote another like progress report Mm -hmm. saying, outlining everything saying, even if Nick were to agree to take medication, I will never sign him off to go be a cop. Even with, you can have him take six months of medication, a year of medication. I'm never going to allow him to come back and be a cop. Because it's all that's going to do is mask all his issues. And then, you know, it, he's what happens if he right. misses his meds one day. There you go. <laughs> so, and, and the way my psychologist explained this to me is meds and treatment, right. Are, are parallel. They parallel each other. It's not like there's some magic pill that takes right. us away. Either one of them are, are, are equal. Not one's not better than the other. It's just what works for you. For yeah, each person. Right. And both, by the way, like <clears throat> the person in the treatment and taking the drugs has to want to do both. Right. Right. So in my, in my, you know, discussions with my psychologist and even the discussions I had with human resources, I'm like, so I'm going through all this stuff, trying to make myself right. And then my personal opinion, my personal decision to not take meds. Now I'm feeling like I'm forced to take meds. Do you think my treatment's going to go well? No, I'm going to be pissed about taking meds. I don't want to take meds. I'm going to have side effects that I'm worried about. And some of the side effects from my PTSD stuff was I had, I had this like undeniable worry about what's coming next. Like, I don't know the future. Something could happen mm-hmm. quickly. I, I was very paranoid about things that weren't going to happen, but I thought they were. Um, and, and so medication, I could see myself like, Hey dude, if I'm taking meds, what if, what if in a week I have you know, suicidal someone, thoughts? Yeah. And so I'm like, dude, I, I am not taking it. So I get this yeah, you're phone just, call. You're just exacerbating the issue. Right. So I, I talk to human resources. Even by taking like a placebo, you'd be, <laughs> you'd be exacerbating right. the issue. Well, and, and like, I'm saying this stuff out loud, like having conversations with my wife and my wife's on board with the same thing. And I'm like, everybody literally agrees with me. Except for. Except for these. And I don't understand why. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm going to call 
human resources. So I call human resources and we have a conversation about it. Meanwhile, this, this report my psychologist sends in is saying these things. And she's like, okay. And I told her, I'm like, look, it, it's getting real close for, for me. Um, I'm feeling like I'm being forced to take medication. And if that comes down to it, I, I'm going to be a real loud pain in the yeah, ass. I'm going to sue the shit out of yeah, you. Like I'm, I didn't, yeah. I, I didn't even, I didn't say like that. You don't need to. Right. But, but I was like, that's where you're going, man. Yeah. Like yeah. I, this is going to be a problem for everyone and I'm coming full force with it. And so she even said like, no, God, no, no one like, no one's going to enforce yeah, it. She, she's like taking it all in going, so, wow, she doesn't know. Keep him, and then this is another thing where it's like they have no communication with the workers. That's what I'm saying. She doesn't know. Like, right. She has no idea what's going on with it. Right. You. So she's like, hey, I'll get back to you. I'll figure out kind of where this is, you know? Um, and then I get a call four days later and retirement date. <laughs> so you get left on this island all by yourself. And yeah. if it's not for you being <clears throat> sort of a self advocate to go back exactly. to the people, are, were you surprised by that? <sighs> In the end, no, because the, the entire journey of this workers comp complete shit show. Um, I knew in the end, I'm like, dude, I can't just sit and wait because there, this nothing is going to get done. Or if it does, it's going to take two, two and a half, three years. So I, I guess what I'm part of the reason we are connected is through the Overwatch collective. Yeah. And the things that go on that Time can be the real enemy for people in these situations, running these high stress situations. Yeah. I've had other folks on the show that have talked about, about it and, and sort of described it as uh, my buddy, Rick field over in the central Valley described it as like, you reach this period of darkness and you don't think there's a way out. And then things happen in that time. People make decisions, yeah. life altering, life changing decisions, not just for them, but for people around them. You're 19 months into the path and all you're trying to do is move on with your life, but you're a young dude. It's not like you're, right. it's not like you're 50 years old trying right. to get retirement. You're 31 trying to figure out how you're going to go, go next. That amount of stress that that creates for somebody else. And I'm sure it's happening. Oh, hundred percent. So many, many other people mm -hmm. in the process is could be driving them that whole process in and of itself, not having answers, being spun back through the spin cycle thing. Hey, if you're not playing ball, then you're not going to be on, then we're not going to be on board with this. That kind of, that kind of thing could be driving some, some people to literally take their own lives. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. That ever crossed your mind? No, I, I got to a real dark place. Um, and that dark place pushed me to make some mistakes in my life and, and kind of make it hard for me, my kids and my wife to continue our good relationship. Mm -hmm. Luckily that changed and I got it out, you know, and, and I got past it, but it never reached there. Like a terminal. But point, yeah. in those dark times, it, it was, I don't know how much further it could have gone. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and the one thing that um, worked for me Cause not a lot of, not, not a lot of shit worked for me. You know what I mean? I, I like, obviously I did everything in my treatment program and, and, you know, in the very beginning stages, there's a lot of outlines, you know, Hey, day to day is very structured from your psychologist. These are the things I want you doing every single day, writing down what's going on. I mean, it's very detailed. It worked for sure. You know, it definitely worked, but I found myself months and months and months and I'm still struggling. Mm -hmm. And I had to kind of have one of those look in the mirror and conversations with yourself. And I'm like, look, dude, you're rock bottom right now. Like this is what it is. And, and you can still kind of try to dig a hole deeper and deeper. Um, but I kind of relied on once you hit rock bottom, the only way to go up, you know, the only way to go is up. So that didn't even work. You know, I'm like, well, yeah, it's up, but how, how do I even get up? So what I did, what worked for me and hopefully by me saying this, maybe it would work for, for others. Um, in that like conversation with myself in the mirror, I realized like, Hey, I got to turn this into a good thing. Very hard to do when you have PTSD. Like how, how is this good? This sucks, you know? But when you're rock bottom, I realized, Hey, I can reinvent myself. Like all of my shit that I had, it's out in the open now. And now I'm, I'm kind of a blank slate. You know, although I'm dealing with this, I'm, I'm, I feel like a blank piece of paper. So everything I wanted to be like, cause you know, when you're working as a cop, dude, you're very one way. 
And you can't voice opinions, really. You can't be a certain type of person. And I yeah, looked at it. You have to it. be very calculated. And yeah, even, I looked at it. I, careful. And I, and, and I was like, you know, how, how can I make this good? So I was like, I'm going to reinvent myself. Now I'm going to start working up, but I'm going to start making changes that I always wanted to make to make myself better from this. Mm. So it kind of turned it into a, a motivator for me and a good thing. Yes, I have this. Yes, it's going to be a constant struggle. And even to today, every day is mm-hmm. up and down. Mm-hmm. Um, but if I keep on that road of going up and kind of reinvent myself and having this life to where now it's open for me, you know what I mean? Like it, now it's not just cop work. It's like a redirected energy yeah. yeah instead yeah. of a misdirected energy. Exactly. Or kind of a stagnant energy. You're, you're doing something and you're figuring it out as you go versus right. like, nope, can't do, nope, can't do that. Nope. Right. Man, you know, there's some, I got to circle back to that's the dog. The dog was the best thing. You know, obviously not a lot of people get to be canine handlers. And I think the hardest thing for me was getting my canine career cut short. Right. It you didn't get to finish that. killed huh? me, dude. Yeah. You know, it killed me. That was the worst. Not being a cop anymore, I could let that go. I could let that go. I did what I did. I was proud of what I did. My, my reputation was good when I left. I was like, I'm solid with that. Although it's not many years in this career, eight years is nothing compared to, you know, some of these people out 30, 35, you know what I mean? Years of service in this. But I, I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm good with what I did because I did a lot. You know what I mean? And no one's ever going to say no, because I got facts, you know what I mean? Right. And so when I realized like, damn, dude, I, I can't even hold this leash anymore and hunt bad guys with my dog. Like it destroyed me. Um, and then I had the struggle with, I may have to give this dog back. Right. Like I may, I may have to give him back to the agency because he's a four-year-old Mal. He's a, he's a tool. He's an agency he's tool. owned tool. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, they never said a word, never said a word, never talked to me about like, Hey, how's the dog doing? Like you may have to give him back. There's no word. I had had conversations behind closed doors with some people. Um, and I get a phone call, you know, before I even had a retirement date, which was another kind of whirlwind for me where it was like, I'm, I have zero retirement data. I have no communication with the city or, or anything about retirement. But I get a call from the chief. Super cool. He was like, hey man, um, you know, we had some communication through workers comp and, you know, that communication basically told us you're not coming back. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. You know, and I was waiting for, hey dude, we got to, right. we got to take the Where's dog. the shoe, other shoe drop? Yeah. Um, and he goes, um, so what's up with your dog? You know, and I'm like, dude, he's fine. You know what I mean? I was like, he's, it's he's, fine. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. He's totally cool. Like, don't ask any more yeah. questions about That's him. That's good. Let's move on. I was hoping yeah. you forget about him. Next yeah. question. Yeah. And he's like, so uh, do you want to keep him? I'm like, yeah. He's like, all right. Um, and then he said some outlandish number for money. And I'm all done. Like, done. I don't, I'll sell my house, dude. And he started laughing. And he's like, nah, it's, dude, this number, I'll send the contract to you. And I was like, just weight off my shoulders. Wow. Man. And, uh, for an agency to sell a dog to a handler who only had, I think I was a handler for two and a half, three years. Yeah. That's a, that's a young dog. I mean, you were just saying things were just starting to really click for, for Dude, him and for you. I was right? just getting comfortable, yeah. just getting comfortable. And for them to do that for me meant everything, you know, it showed me that, you know, even though bad shit happens, at least in the end, they were like, Dude, we support you. We know what the dog is to you and who cares about money. We'll get right. another dog and right. we'll get another handler and, and you live the rest of your life with him. Do the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of doing the right thing. So, I mean, you have all this, man, this experience, these crazy, I mean, they're crazy stories, but they're real stories and they're your stories. And now you've had this, this last 19 months of stuff and we're only eight days into official retirement. Right. Now. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I mean, you're 31 years old. You've already said it. Um, you got a strong family. You got a strong community, strong support. Yeah. Uh, you got all this experience under underneath you. What are you going to do? You know, I, it's funny. I uh, actually moved to Idaho. Uh, best decision of my life. Um, and once I got out there, man, the, it, it kind of, the world opened up. You know, I met a lot of cool people. Um, I actually got linked up with a mutual friend of one of my good buddies. Um, and he trains dogs. 
<laughs> and, uh, here we are honorable yeah. canine out of, out of Nampa, Idaho, man. And, uh, you know, I, I was like, I don't know how this is going to feel. I don't know, like if this is going to, I'm going to have the same kind of push for it. Um, and I hadn't been to training clean slate, like, though, dude, dude, 19 months, no training, no bite work, no nothing. Cause I was unmotivated through this up and down battle with this PTSD. To put shit. That to bed. Yeah. Right. Or and, you put the, sorry, you put the paperwork piece to bed. Right. Right. And then like all I was doing with my dog was just taking him on long hikes and walks and just being with him. Like that's what helped me the most. It wasn't about like taking him and working with him because sometimes that would bring back, mm -hmm. you know, the shit. And, and so I hadn't been doing a whole lot of work and he needed work. You know, he'd been off street for 19 months. Uh, he said he's a knucklehead. And he's a knucklehead. Once so, a knucklehead, always a knucklehead. <laughs> yeah. So it was cool. We, we linked up. Um, I've been to a couple, um, trainings with him. We, there's a little training group that he has with some of his buddies. Um, one of his other buddies actually owns his own dog company, um, curator canine out of, out of Nampa, Idaho. And they are do their professional decoys for police dogs. They literally go to, to the police department. departments and they're contracted they with, with police them. and they work with them, dude. They, yeah. they catch bikes for actual canine handlers and then do board and train on their own. So I was like, dude, this is, this is what I need. And this is awesome. So we met up did some bite work, did some obedience training. And, you know, none of them were canine handlers. They were all cops, they're all retired cops, but, and they're all my age. Um, but, I, you know, some people in this canine world will say like, you're never going to make it if you've never been a handler. I've heard that said before, right, right there in that right. seat. And that is the biggest bullshit statement ever because these dudes that I'm training with now, legit <laughs> legit and and they're they're helping me dude i'm learning stuff from them i've worked a dog on the street none of them have and they're teaching me i'm a dude a handler only knows what he knows too like i i know how to train my dog you specific yeah and you were trained by a certain group of people like we're right. trained by another certain group of people right. and this is the protocol and this yeah. is policies and this is what we do yeah and, and could they you know do they lean on me for like practical real life stuff like what's you know how did you do this or right. what kind of training sure but dude i'm learning from them Right. They ain't learning from me. Right. And, and so it, it, it's been real cool. So, um, I actually met, um, a dude out there, a prior military guy. He owns a company, um, veteran owned and operated. And he's like, Hey dude, um, once your stuff is done, you come see me, you have a job. You're going to run my day-to-day -day operations for my small business and, uh, sit in the up. office and, and you know what I mean? You do payroll, you do, um, sales and I'm in charge of a, you know, a couple technicians that they have, but I can't really, I couldn't start it until my stuff was yeah, done. Yeah. Right. So that's linked up and that's, uh, you know, about, about to, to start, about to go. We're in the process of buying a, um, a house out there on some land and, and dude, it's just now it's the rest of my life. And, yeah. and the only thing I'm really focused on, man, is just watching my kids grow. That's you know great. what I mean? I, I don't care about nothing else. You, you, uh, you mentioned something to me about like, you've got all these things kind of working. It sounds like, and I imagine that's going to happen for a long time. You got to figure it yeah. out, you know, figure yeah. out the new, the new path and there'll be some ups and downs and all that other stuff. But you mentioned to me that, you know, you'd thought about maybe putting together some type of a service to help people get through the process that you went through. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so I'm in the very beginning stages of building um, this company. It's called the Code 33 Project. And yes, focused on helping first responders, PTSD awareness, you know, advocacy for them. Um, but what it's primarily directed for is helping cops specifically. Um, because I, you know, I, I would love to get into fire and email, it's all but, different I, though, but yeah. it's all different. So yeah. I'm not going to talk about anything I don't know yet. We'll get there. Um, but helping cops get through this retirement process with battling, you know, insurance companies and doctors and lawyers and cities, because it, it, it is its own animal in itself. And with someone who has just been through it and, and fought, you know, and had a bunch of shit happen. Um, I want to push, you know, something to help them. Like, look, dude, this is what helped. This would help me. Here's the people that helped me. And so here's what to expect. Exactly. So you're maybe not caught off exactly. guard. Yeah. And honestly, man, it could turn into something that I've been thinking about and start my own workers comp insurance company, man, where it's, it's not because can't, if you can't beat them, fucking join them. Right. And, and, and the thing is, is what I recognize is I think most of, most of the people who work for these workers comps comp companies, we don't know if they like cops. And it started to get real clear to me that they had their own opinions on cops. You know what I mean? And, and they're 
who knows if that's accurate or not. I'm, so I'm not going to say it as a, you know, a definitive statement, but it felt like that. Yep. You know what I mean? And, and, and dude, I, I work the street. I know I'm a cop. I understand that. Spidey senses. Spidey there, right? senses. So I, no one's going to tell me it ain't, it's any different. So to get an insurance company built, right. Who doesn't love cops to the point where we're, you know, going to give them. Frivolously, they yeah, signing yeah, shit off. Yeah. Totally. But get some people who are, are not one way or the other. I think it's important to understand kind of where the, the cops are going through or what that person may be going through too. It's like going back to seeing a psychologist or seeing a counselor and, you know, again, talking with the, the folks that we know, Greg and Jesse, whatever is getting in front of somebody that actually can relate and understands right. what the job is. It's not just pushing paper yeah. and it's not that, you know, that four year degree that you got to become a counselor and you're coming down right. and now you're in your early twenties and you're dealing with a 40 year old cop who's been through more shit than you could even imagine. Right. And they're looking at you with their, as the police officer, you know, the counselor's looking at you with their jaw on their chest going, Oh, now I'm fucked up. Now right. I have PTS from this session, <laughs> right. you know, kind of thing. So getting in front of some people that, that, can collectively make the process go and maybe have conversations to help people understand why it is the way it is or where they're yeah. going or how to help themselves. I think it's amazing. And I think we, you know, obviously this day and age, it's harder than ever probably to be a, a police officer in the United States of America. Um, you've already articulated a lot of reasons why just from the job itself. But oh, yeah, dude. when you yeah. go through stuff like that and you have to come out the other side and continue to battle, um, still wanting to be a cop, you know, even, you know, yeah. but not, not, not being able to do it anymore. I think it's awesome. I think anything you do, man, if you just go back, you know, to your origin story and to the beginning, anything you set your mind to, this would be outstanding. I love Idaho. Um, I have it's some very good cool. friends out there. One of yeah. our, four, one of our former coaches here moved his family out there for right. the same reasons you moved you yourself out yeah. there and he's doing some great stuff. So to come out there and see the dogs and yeah, dude. do some work. For sure. For sure, dude. It, it's, Best place I've ever lived. Well, I appreciate you coming in, man, and sharing your story. Uh, and I, I'm convinced that, you know, this is going to touch some people in a different way. And I hope it drives them in a little different direction to think a little bit differently about things, both on the law enforcement and non law enforcement side in terms of how we can support one another better. So thanks. Thanks, brother. Appreciate you. Hey man, I appreciate the opportunity, dude. So thank you. All right.